Um, so yeah, really looking forward to the day and I'll pass over to Professor Chris Watley who will be able to tell you a bit more about the RSE and introduce the first speaker. Thank you. Thanks, Becky. Becky and her colleagues do deserve a real big round of applause, actually, because they have organised it. I mean, Des and I come up with the ideas, they do the business, and it's been, it's been really tremendous, and we should not overlook that. And if I forget later on, as I may forget later on, as we close the event, let's just say thank you very much, <laughs> Becky and Steve. Okay, well, I'm not going to say anything about the RSE this morning because I said it yesterday. Um, uh, what I will do is just get right on with the, with the business. Um, and the first speaker today is um, someone who, when Des and I thought, started thinking about this northwest um, uh, embar em embarkation, if you like, of the RSE into the north and the west, I think it was Des that said, we must have Frank Rennie. And of course, um, well, he's here, which is great. And one of the great things about, nice things about being involved in the organisation, something like that, is you hear about people you've never, but you come to these things and you meet them. And it's, and it's been a pleasure to meet, uh, meet, meet, um, meet um, Frank. Now, he is probably not needing any introduction in, in, in a place like this. He's, he's a professor at UAHI. He's um, hugely active in all sorts of things. Um, he's written, I think, 36 books, and I'm talking to you this morning. There's probably another two or three on the way. Um, but I've only read one of them, and it's this Golson, um, Changing Outer Hebrides, Golson and the Meaning of Place. And I think that's a, just a tremendous piece of work. It, it, it's, it's, it's well, if you haven't read it, you should read it. It's, it's so rich and deep and um, powerful as well. And it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's kind of follows the theme I was, or probably sets the theme I was talking about yesterday, and that is the past feeding into the present and into action for day and, to, and tomorrow. So I thought that was tremendous, is tremendous. And I should say something else. I meant to say this yesterday, that um, I happened to chair the Saltire Society's Scottish History Book of the Year panel, and every, virtually every year, Akia is in the top two or three in terms of the books which um, are, are, are submitted for as nominations of, of books of the year. A tremendous publishing house, and, and that should be recognised here. Uh, you should be proud of that in Stornoway, um, and, and it should be better known elsewhere in the country. So, um, without further ado, I'm going to invite Frank to talk, and he is going to talk about, I need my bit of paper here, I'm not about crofting, <laughs> um, the future of crofting, um, vibrant viability. So, over to you, Frank. Thanks for having me. Nothing about you, don't you? Good to see you on a Saturday morning. Um, let me just check. I'll, I'll talk, I think we're half an hour, so we'll talk for 20 minutes and, or thereabouts and then we'll get a chance for, for questions and feel free to heckle as I go through because it's quite, it adds to the piquancy of the, of the, of the meeting. Why are we talking about crofting uh, at an island's event? Because crofting affects all of us. Whether you think it or not, whether you're a crofter or not, whether you're an active crofter or not, it affects you. Crofting, I'm often asked, do you think crofting has a future? Yes, I do. I think crofting has a vibrant future, but not a future that is based upon what we did when we were children, what our fathers, what our grandfathers, or great-grandfathers for some people in this audience, um, how they did it. It will change, because it has changed over the years. And my talk um, will be um, featuring several negative issues within this thing go through, but it's not a negative talk, it's a very positive talk. I was, David and I were, Ron, I was saying this morning, when you have a platform, when you're given a platform and you don't say what you think, then you've only got yourself to blame if people don't know what you, what, what you, what you mean. Crofting is approaching a crisis. It's approaching a crisis because of central government indifference, of a perpetuation of lies and myths um, and a belief in the system rather than a belief in the people. When the Crofting Act, I, I won't go into the history of the creation of Croft, so you can, we can do it later. And you don't have to take notes, Des, because I've, I've written all this out in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a paper that you can, well, I can happily circulate or I can give it to Becky to circulate to anyone who's interested afterwards. The history of Crofting, Crofting was deliberately set up 
to try and make space for these people who were dispossessed from the land. Um, it wasn't designed to be a farming system, it was designed to be a subsistence, so they were dependent upon the landowner themselves. So they were always beholden to finding other employment. But what turned out as a curse um, at that time has now become a blessing because crofting perpetuates every aspect of our lives. Culture, social structure, um, economics, and the environment, the natural environment of these islands. And let me go into them just very briefly as it goes through. So, social issues. Up until, I don't know the figure right now, but up until very recently, I think uh, three or four perhaps of all the houses in the Western Isles were or had been croft houses. The rest was all things in Stornoway and bits of Tarbert and so on, houses that. It's a massive contribution to the housing. Because, because you can't get a, a, a mortgage, um, if, if, if you get a mortgage and you don't pay your mortgage back, the bank takes your house. Because you have security of tenure, they can't take your, they can't take your property. Therefore, the banks and their woods don't give you a loan, don't give you a mortgage. So there had to be a system by which you could get, get, um, build a house. And there used to be a system called, well, there is still crofting, the CBGLS, Crofting Building Grant and Loan Scheme, which provided a loan as well as um, a grant for new families to build crofts on, 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 on uh, to build houses on the crofts. That has been watered down so it's virtually impossible to access. And so it's difficult to actually build new places. We have people now buying property, buying crofts, buying the tenancy of crofts, as Brian Wilson accurately said yesterday, not buying the land, but buying the right to be a tenant and paying hundreds of thousands of pounds for the view. Not using the land, ignoring that, um, sometimes knocking down the house to build another house, sometimes buying houses online without even seeing them for crazy sums, simply because it has a wonderful view. We even have instances, and I can tell you who they are if, if I want to name check, um, of people who have bought a house for the view, and then the adjacent croft has become available, and they've bought that as well because they don't want anybody building a house to spoil their view. That means that the, the housing uh, availability has been priced out of the market for local people or people wanting to move in. We talked about the, the demography problem yesterday about needing to attract more families and so on and so forth. That social issue has a knock-on effect right across the community. It means that even if people wanted to stay, um, they have to live with their parents or move on as it goes through there. Many of the, many of the crofts in the area, and the croft is the land, remember, not the house. It really, one of, the, one, of my merry, one of my merry irritants is when people talk about, I saw an instant recently where someone talked on Twitter about a two-story croft, and I said, God, that must be an instant. How do they, how, how do they work the drainage? <laughs> so the idea behind this is that people think about these things in terms of that loose. And so the land itself has become unused. In terms of culture, it's really important because the majority of the crofting areas, um, Stornoway, uh, its town you know, being an exception really, are Gaelic speaking. But not just that, the, the need to actually make ends meet made people um, become involved in what the French call pluriactivity, we call multiple job holding. It means that many people do many things to make ends meet. So we have Taxi drivers, shopkeepers, librarians, doctors, dentists, you know, medics of all sorts, whatnot, even the odd professor, who are crofters at the same time. And it doesn't matter what your income bracket is or how, the, how your status is with a hand or with a, or with a hand, with, with a hand or the heart. When you're in your wellies at the fank, you're all the same. It's a great egalitarian uh, process. But it's created this actually rich seam of skills and talents and make do within the crofting community. Some people have said, and Jim Hunter and I have debated this because Jim and I are the, the crofting historian, are, are long-time friends. P people have said um, all the best have got up and left. The people with, with gumption have got up and left these communities. And my attitude is the people who stayed and made it work are the ones with the smidum, not the ones who have left. 
So it's different for different people. Um, and I, 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 don't, I don't denigrate. You know, my own girls have, have, have gone away, and, and hopefully they will come back at some point. So it's, it's, you make a choice and you go there. But that choice is now being narrowed down because of the, uh, the abandonment, essentially, of Crofts. In terms of economics, it makes an issue, not just because, not just because um, of the multiple job holding, but because traditionally within the circles of power and government agencies, crofting is looked upon as impoverished agriculture. It's not. It is not the poor man's agriculture. Agriculture is a recurrent theme all through crofting, but it's not the be-all and the end-all. They are not just make-do farmers that can't make the, make, make the cut. Um, and I see the future, for example, in things like polytunnels. I see the things in collaborative issues on, on, on management. I see the things spilling over, as I'll come to a second, in environmental issues with actually managing the land um, in a way with sacrificial crops and so on that people don't want to do that in order to maintain that environment. So crofts, because they are small and because the rent is minimal, then if it's passed from generation to generation and they don't want to work the land or they have no inclination to work on the croft, they don't have to. It's not like a farm where you have maybe 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 acres that's just doing nothing and losing you money. You can afford this not to do anything with it because it's only a few acres. It's, not going to, it's no big deal. It's a place to walk the dog and go for a walk on a Sunday. That, that's all it is. So you're, you're not actually, it's not penalizing your income, but actually it's having a negative overall effect in the, in the, in the, on, the, on the society. In terms of um, the environment, the natural environment, this is, to me, it's a big, big issue. Because, because you know, traditionally, crofts would have been worked with um, small, um, Patches. The average croft size in the Outer Hebrides is about five acres. Um, some are much bigger, some are much, much smaller. Um, the, the typical croft, though, would have grazing, would have rough, rough grazing, permanent grassland. It would have some patch of land for, for hay or for haylage or for, for silage nowadays. Maybe some potatoes, maybe some stubble turnip. Um, it may have some oats that would be, you know, be used for, for uh, sheep and cattle. Um, it shifted away in Thailand and the common grazing, the common grazing being the heather, um, the moorland and so on, where it, which was used at part of the year. Um, it was always my contention, for example, in the environmentally sensitive areas of UST, the big argument with the, with the civil service was the fact that they would not include the moor, the common, because that wasn't part of the, the machar area that was, that, was, that was environmentally sensitive. But the argument I would make there was that the marker was only able to be used because people could remove the stock during the year and put them on the moor, right? So that was part of the whole local ecosystem that allowed the marker to rest and to be, to be rotated and so on and so forth. And it, just, it was a fundamental misunderstanding of what the, what the system was. It's significant for me that the, 19, the 1886 Act, which, which encapsulated crofting, which gave the right of the, the security of tenure, etc., was the Crofters Act, and we have lost that. We now have not the Crofters Commission, but the Crofting Commission. Not the Scottish Crofters Union, but the Crofting Federation. People should be at the centre of that system, not crofting the system which is then ossified and fossilised and protected. And so um, the... Shocksmith inquiry, 16 or so years ago there, produced some uh, radical solutions which everybody virtually agreed needed to be done, including politicians, 80% of crofters. And papers that have just come out from Scottish government and public access and so on have shown quite unequivocally that civil servants briefed against these and argued the case with ministers that these were they should not be done. They argued for, for, the, for free market for crofting, not protected. They argued for more centralization, not for local regionalization of policy. Um, they, they argued against the idea of the crofting building grant and loan scheme because they thought it should be floated out and it would find its own level. And it has, it's through the bloody floor. 
right? What we need to do is look at these things again and take them in, in store and say, this was recommended at the time, this was agreed, and either through ignorance or just through a dismissive patronizing attitude, these things were dismissed. And the results are clear to everybody now. The housing situation is worse. The land management system is worse. The population the drift has not been stemmed. And the natural history, the natural environment of the area is on the verge of suffering in, numerous, in numerous areas. We can go into that in more detail. I think um, in the case of, we, we, there were, some of these things were touched upon yesterday. I'm just watching my time. Um, all right. Um, with some of these things were touched upon yesterday. Um, in terms of housing, for example, the, the th one of the things that is new and the game changer, in my view, are community land trusts. The community land trusts in the Hebrides are by and large crofting estates. And the crofting estates have the power to release land for social housing, for example. Not 100 house schemes, but six here and four there and five there. More appropriately, in my view, they also have the potential to place a burden on them. So that if you then choose not to live in that house, you don't sell it for profit. It goes back into the community in the same way as a croft does. There used to be schemes like, um, there used to be schemes, for example, like, so, so that, and that, by the way, that also gives the, the chance for the local policy implementation at that level um, to, to be, to be fine-tuned. We heard yesterday about the shift of services um, being, being, being dumped or potentially dumped on, on crofting trusts and so on and so forth. Nevertheless, the power to take decision and the power not to be beholden to, to the policies of other people and funding bodies and whatnot is a powerful motivating factor. The, the, the fact that you own the land, and in Galson's case, three turbines that, that bring in nearly a million pound to their community each year, depending on the, the tariff and the wind and all that sort of stuff. I'm sure Neil will correct me in more to the, to the nearest penny before, before we go. But, but largely, it's, it's significant money. And that means, and, and we have done that in, in this college, in meetings I've been at in this college, we've said, actually, if that's what you want to impose, we don't want your funding. We can do it without you. It'll be more difficult, but we can do it, and we will. So we can create housing, we can create a burden, we can create people, we can feed them back into, into communities. We can also be looking at, um, there used to be a, a creative scheme, which was um, uh, a, basically a machinery cooperative. Not every, because crofting is a very small scale, low input, low output, um, our colleague Eric Bignall has waxed lyrically on this about, about the potential you know, for, for managing land without environmental damage, without hammering with, with, with pollutants and pesticides and goodness knows what, and fertilizers, but actually using it more in a more low input, but low output, but more sustainable system. Because of that, you don't need to have um, big moors with every single person. You don't need to have tractors in every croft. You don't need to have all the, the expensive equipment. You can share it. And there used to be a great scheme for doing that, um, which technically still exists, but actually is not pushed. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not encouraged. Yeah? HIDB move, was set up specifically because of market failure in the Highlands and Islands. There are areas where there are not enough people to maintain the shop or the post office or the, or the garage. So therefore, they have to be, if you want those services there, if you want access to a hospital and a medic, medical center and so on, you have to actually support them. You have to invest in them. You know, we talk about investment in roads and subsidy for farmers and crofters. What, where, where's the consistency in that? As my father used to say, when was the last time the army had to make a profit? Okay, so thinking about these things in a different, it's not just semantics, it's important to understand the words. If you actually encourage schemes where crofters would share equipment, but not just that, things like Nature Score, RSPB, John Muir, if they worked with communities rather than becoming landowners themselves, yeah, 
in, in working with community. All the research all over the world has shown that nature conservation does not succeed unless you get local communities going with you. That's, whether it's elephants and giraffes or whatever, that's the case. Okay, 40% of, of, only 40% of, of corn crakes, for example, if I may have a little the, 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 the distraction, only 40% in Europe actually breed on what we could call protected areas. The other 60% go wherever they want. So do Merlins, by the way, but that's another story. Um, and so if we're looking at these things, um, we have to think about the whole landscape and manage the whole landscape. So it should be possible to speak to um, communities, crofters and communities who don't want to, to, to manage the land during their lifetime, to actually manage the land on their behalf and grow sacrificial crops that provide the habitat for these animals to exist without giving up the croft, without... So, so why you wouldn't want to give up the croft because it's your family, your, your parents, your grandparents will not have, have a, a legacy on that. Go, crofting is only here because it fought the system. It was told, you know, 150 odd years ago, 1886, that they shouldn't exist. And they said, bugger it. We, we're, we're here. Okay, it's 150 years since this year, since the Bernara riot, the so-called Bernara riot, when they chased off the bailiffs who came to evict them with sticks and stones. It's 100 years this year since the resettlement of, of, of our village, where Agnes and I live, Gulf, South Galton, North Galton. And that was resettled just after the First World War, after continuous land raids and land agitation. Pulling it down, the wall, pulling the walls down, letting the letting the, the farmers, um, you know, animals escape, and so on. The government responded in its infinite wisdom by sending in the army. Two gunboats were sent to Stornoway from Glasgow, and the offer of 200 police from Ed, from England, if it was necessary, to keep the peace here. And the only building that was in the place was the was the Gulson farmhouse where they were billeted. Now. There are well over 100 houses with, within the village, all built since then. And we're planning a celebration later on this year to have 100 years of a crofting village. It can be done again. You have to think about these things and how they're managed in those scores. You have to think about the way in which um, crofts are made available on the open market. They were deliberately created not to make a profit. The crofters system, not the crofting system, the system for crofters was designed to give access to a house and a wee bit of land for people to exist. If you look at the area um, where, where we live, where I live, on the, on the, the west, west coast, we're, we're not, well, I would say, um, Magnus might disagree with me, but I would say we're Shirox, we're West Siders, not Nishox and Ness. Okay, it's a controversial issue, I know, and I'm, I'll be heckled for it later on. But uh, <coughs> um, I, I would say definitely a Shirox. But the, the West Side of Lewis, including Ness, um, has a greater population than the mainland from north of Ullapool, right up the coast to Cape Wrath, and right along the coast to Tongue. There are more people on the west of Lewis than that whole area. And the reason, because those areas were cleared as well and they weren't resettled. They weren't resettled with crofting. There were little scrabbly patches that were created around the landscape. You know the, the great play achieving the stack in the black back oil? And they said, well, you have a port. They said, yes, look, Inver will do. And that was, the, that was the language of the time. That was the mentality. But the crofting areas here were only maintained through civil disobedience, through challenging the system and by going through. And these guys who were challenged, who were arrested, who were taken to the High Court in, in, in Edinburgh and whatnot, were, were released um, you know, free. And they were heroes. They were regarded as heroes, not as villains, not with a criminal record. So there's lots to, rem to remind in that particular story. Um, I think it's perhaps time we got back to it. We've been a bit more bumptious and a bit more obstreperous with these things. I definitely do things. 
If we're thinking about the future of crofting, we need to think about that in terms of managing that in the entirety for the benefit of the community. And this is why the, the community land trusts are not just crofters' trusts. You can become a member of the community land trust as a resident of the community. Because you can't get away from the crofting. It's right next door to you. It's your, it's your brothers and your neighbours or your auntie or your cousin along the road there who are part of that. And that is part of, the, of, of the, the rich cultural fabric of this area. What you need to remember is it's about crofters. It's a system to support people who would then manage the land in a certain way. And if we lose that, we all suffer because the landscape itself will change. The wildlife that people come to see here will change. I think there's a, there's a huge um, potential for crofting as it goes through, and I'd like to see crofting extended to other areas of the mainland. Um, when we went through the, the old... I have a history of the, the... If you pardon me, the old Scottish Crofters' Union, which was 40 years ago. It's now. Where did the years go? Um, the Scottish Crofters' Union was the first association... It wasn't a trade union, it was like a community association that brought the small local unions across Scotland together in one. And it was a powerful, powerful vehicle. It brought more people out of the, lime, out of the, the shadows into the limelight, people who'd never been involved in politics with a capital or a small p ever, because they saw it made a difference to their lives. It was galvanising. It was galvanising. I think, uh, I can't remember who was it, you were talking about Hamish Gray yesterday, or, yeah, yeah, Hamish Gray, the first meeting we ever had with Hamish Gray, and there was a chap, a civil servant beside him called Frank Laurie, who was the, who was the, the, the um, you know, Humphrey, <laughs> um, and he used to say to Hamish, when Hamish Gray, who's a nice old codger, made his coming, I think what the minister means is, and he translated all the way through the meeting, um, and then when I put a thing on the table about, about uh, one of the, the issues at the time, which actually was Crofter Housing, I think, Frank, what you mean is now, whoa, stop right there. You heard what I mean. And one of the impediments has been this, if I can call it, this central belt mentality that crofting is some sort of primitive agriculture, that it's existing on the fringes, it's so quaint and romantic. Wouldn't it be nice to have a croft? It's there to maintain the fabric of the community. And if we lose that, we're screwed. I welcome any questions. Right, thanks. Thank you very much, Frank. That was uh, passionate, but passion informed by deep knowledge and understanding and evidence-based. So super, I, I thought that was tremendous. So, um, we've got plenty of time for questions, actually, so, and, and you're free to answer at length, actually, because you've, you've left yourself so much time. So, um, any questions? Surely must be. Well, let me start with some, something which is kind of not banal, but it's, it's, it's minor, but I think significant, given the difficulty of raising capital for equipment and so forth. Why has the sharing of equipment scheme not worked in the way that it should have done? Because human beings are human beings, it's self-interest. In the same way as, in the same way as, um, as I said, 80% of crofters, um, by, by by some estimates, actually supported um, the results of, of uh, my my friend Mark Shuckman, Professor Shuckman's recommendations. There was a small minority, a vociferous minority, who opposed it, and they opposed it, I think, because they benefited from the system as it stands. They've collected a number of crofts themselves, and they don't want to, to let lease them. They've got subleases of their crofts. They have sold houses for a profit. They perhaps, we have the case of, you know, we moved to Glasgow, um, and you, you still have the family croft, but we still come up once a year for, for a week or two. So we're not going to pass it away. But then you get a chance to sell that in Harris for 250,000. You're going to do that, aren't you? Absolutely. And it's, it creates that mentality. It creates that... It creates that um, sort of 
on a pedestal almost at this this quaint little system there. I, I was giving a talk, and there are many, there are many, as Rona will know as well. There are many trigger words that I have. Remote is one of them. Um, you've been remote. I'm not remote. Remote from what? Remote from Glasgow? You're remote from me, really. You know, I'm not remote. I, I went. I gave a I gave a talk in, in on a research project I was working at the time in in Covent. Uh, well, I, I gave a talk in Covent Garden, in this lovely big palatial building. And I said, thank you for inviting me today to this, this remote location. And they all laughed. And I said, no, seriously, it took me two days to get here. This is really remote. And afterwards, when I was speaking with the, with the, with the, with the chap, who, who, who one of the other speakers, Mono, and he, he obviously he latched onto me, well, I had a different tweed jacket on, but I had a tweed jacket. And so the, the only Scottish connection he, he could think of was the fact that he goes shooting in Scotland, which you might imagine endeared him to me. Um, and I said, oh, well, actually, I'm an, I'm an estate owner myself. Oh, uh, uh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he was, he was, you know. I said, yeah, 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 I'm a estate How big is your estate? And I said, it's 56,000 acres. <laughs> I say, that is big. That is, well, that's very good. I didn't tell him it was a community on the estate, and I was one of hundreds who actually have an owner in the estate. But that shifted his perception in my estimation. When I, when I was, when we were building the house, you know, 80, mid-80s on, on our croft, I came back from Aberdeen and stopped off at the, the BT office, in, in, um, which then became a UHI office now, and it's now a hotel in, in Inverness, Academy Street, to book our telephone, because in those days you had to book months and months ahead to get a phone installed. And so I went in to, to, to book my phone, and he said, uh, I got this sniffy little guy who, who, in, a, in, a, in a sharp suit, who, um, probably because I wasn't wearing a tie, David, yeah, he said, uh, you know, filling out the form, you know, you know, what is your job? And I hesitated, because like many people here, I had many jobs. So I said, I have several. Give me one of them. So I said, Crofter. And he looked at me with this thing and says, give me another. So I said, university lecturer. Oh, that'll do. <laughs> so all of a sudden, my phone was on, the, was on the books. And it is this dismissive attitude towards that. People have argued that you can afford to lose a croft around Inverness because it's so urban anyway. I would argue the reverse. I would argue that you want to keep those green spaces around Inverness and those areas specifically because they are so urbanized. You want to have that access to, to, to wildlife and access to the countryside in the centre of the, of, of the community. The reason that people actually, uh, that things like machinery groups have it, because you have to have complete trust. It's like research. You don't do research with somebody you don't trust, right? Yet, yet, this is the whole thing. You, we, we can, I've, I've explained this in my, in my terms. My office used to be just literally through this wall. Um, you get a phone call that someone says to you, I've got this great project with, with funding and whatnot. Do you, do you want to get involved? And you go, nah. You get a phone call from, from, a, from another friend who said, I've got this great idea. We have no money, but it sounds... Do you want to be involved? And you go, yeah, absolutely. Why? Because you trust the second person, and the first person is a gamble. And your reputation is on the line, as well as anybody else's, when you do this. Yeah. So you actually have to, have to trust. So machinery groups needed to be trusted that you would repair the machinery when you finished it. You would put it back in good state, that you wouldn't allow it to fault the bits if, you, if it was smashed and whatnot as well. And these things require management. These things require effort. Same as the community land trusts. I, I, I've, I've seriously talked about getting Agnes tagged because I need to know, you know how often she's away at these things and various things at different times because it takes up hours and hours and hours of time. Yeah. Don't grudge it at all. Absolutely not. That's what's required to make communities work. And in these communities here, I would say, uh, mm, I wouldn't put a figure on it, but they would not work if it wasn't for the women who put the effort in. Seriously, most of these committees are, are managed and run by women in the community. I, I don't know where the men are. People like, probably meet like people like me that are sitting at home writing books. Um, but if, if you think about that in terms of that one, you've built up a trust within the community. One of the things that, that was mentioned yesterday was in 
things like the WhatsApp group. So the Community Land Trust established during the pandemic WhatsApp group village by village. So if people were having difficulty, they could send messages. Can you pick up my medication? Can you get me a pint of milk if you're in town? That sort of stuff there. So you didn't have to do these things. That creates a bond within the community which used to be there in times of the days of the Cayley, when people would stop and move around, before things like television and social media and Twitter and, yeah, don't get me started on Twitter, Des. We know that we, we went there last night. Um, yeah. Very good. That's a long answer. But a good yeah. One. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're complicated. They, these things are not black and yeah, white. Sure. They're, they're yeah. nuanced. Yeah. Sure. Um, we're on top right-hand side. Yep. So... Could you take the mic over to... Thank you very much. Um, I just wonder, what future do you see for people who want to become people? Sure, but we wouldn't hear you or not. We wouldn't hear you online. So. No. Apologies to folks who are watching online. We've got a problem with the microphones here, but we'll be back Hello. online anyway. There we go. There we go. There right. We go. Thank you very much. I just wondered, what future do you see for folks who would like to become part of those communities, but perhaps don't have the capital of people who've sold their flat in London and want to buy for the view? but want to become active members of a community and want to get into crofting, what, what are the options for them? Perseverance, I think, is the, is the, is the key one. I mean, I think, I think that a lot of... Um, we're, we're increasingly seeing things like community land trusts that are creating social housing. One of the other... And this is not a problem just here. I did a, I did a study... Oh, jeez, I don't know how many years ago, 30 years ago, maybe more, in Sky... Um, looking at, I, I did a lot of stuff on integrated development, including a thing called the Harris IDP that was mentioned yesterday. Uh, you know, I was involved in actually scoping that and surveying that and pulling that together with the community. And doing some work in Sky, um, where in, in Trotternish and Vatternish, in these, these areas, and these are crofting areas, these are not the, the, the Portrees and the Broadfords and whatnot, the, the towns, where people were complaining they couldn't get housing. And so I, I went, I made a trip to Inverness and had the discussion with the, the housing offices and whatnot. Hey, but we're building houses. I said, yeah, where? Well, Portree. I said, but they don't bloody well want them in Portree. They want them in Vatternish. You know, what, do, what, what don't you get? But there's no demand there. No, there's no demand there because they've put their name on the waiting list for houses in Portree because they know they're building houses in Portree. They can't put their name in the for Vatternish because there are not any plans to build them there. That's what you need to do. You need to, you need to dissemble that and, you know, bring that down into, into, into disperse that easier across the areas. Um, and there are indications where um, some of the community land trusts are doing exactly that. They're building houses in small areas and whatnot. But it's a... It's a it's an uphill battle. Gemma and uh, Agnes are there as well. They can tell you a bit more about that later because you, in trying to get the, the permission to become a housing agency, essentially, you have to go through a lot of hoops to go and do these things. But once you can do that, you can then begin to build up. You can even release land for builders, for contracting companies to build land on those areas. You don't have to build them yourself. Okay, they, you, can, you can go into partnership with them. We have to look at new creative partnerships. You need to think laterally with these things because we know that the current system is breaking down. It's breaking down because of social constraints and because people have forgotten what it is to man the barricades and go out and have a land raid. I think we should have a few more. I seriously do. We should be, we should be rattling these things. There's been a huge... There's been a huge um, uh, victory just in the last few days with grouse moors in Scotland, licensing of grouse moors, right? Because people protested. The, you're seeing, if you, if you look at the, the if, you, if you go abroad and, and look at the situation in England, um, you, you will see um, people actually marching on to the, to, to the moor in Dartmoor to claim these things, to claim ownership, to claim right of access that we have as of right in Scotland. One of the things that makes me see, one of the many things that makes me see red, I'm not going to list all my, all my, uh, my 
soapboxes to you. It's people who move here and put up a sign there and say, private, no trespassing. It, it, it really makes me want to reach for my, my kind of spray paint. So you have to understand this community and, and you have to respect it. And you have to understand the roots of this thing. The book that, that Chris was talking about, um, uh, Golson and, and the Meaning of Place, is a view of that village, the view of the world through the lens of that village, from the beginning of the beginning of the earth to now. Joe and I will have different interpretations of, of, of that. But in terms of how it, how it works, in terms of the, the, the duology of this planet right through to the present, and the intricacies, the nuances, the human ecology of the place, the reaction of humans with the natural environment. And that, that affects everything. It affects, affects this college. If you're in a, if you're in a college in, in, in Central Belt, you don't like this stuff, you go around the corner, there's another one. You come with this college, you can't get what you want, you have to leave. You have to go away. You can do it online, perhaps, but you know. But but if you if it's a, a physical thing, you have to go away. So we have to have that bread. I knew was talking about yesterday from from FE all the way through to PhDs. And that, that is critical in these things. There, if we don't do that, we've failed. And the reason we do that is because the majority of people. And it's it's interesting. I I, I went to a physio just last week for, to get acupuncture and all these things, um, who's, a, who's a girl from here, a lady from here, and she was telling me how she went to Glasgow and thought she'd never come back to live in Lewis, never marry a Lyosho. But then she ended up marrying a guy from Lewis and moved back, and she's now, she's now working here living, and loving it, loving it. And there is this visceral re, 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 a, a, a link with these places there, that people want to come and come back to these things, even if it's only temporarily. And we have to create a space so it's not only people who come back when they retire, that's an issue. The possibility of to come back. Some people come back to have children here because it's a great place to bring up children. But then again, if you're, if you're losing all, your, all your, your houses in the community to holiday homes, then the school becomes threatened. There's no preschool playgroup. There's no nursery for these things. There's no need for play parks and so on and so forth. So these things are all interrelated. And if you only think about crofting in terms of sheep and cattle and hens and all that sort of stuff, then you're doing yourself a great disservice. It's a rich tapestry of interrelation between that and, and, and the natural world, which we really have to reinforce very strongly before it's, before it's gone. And that's why it affects every one of you, not just the crofters. Um, no, no, it's fine. It was an online question from Deirdre Mackay, who asks, can you tell us a bit more about why you think the civil servants resisted recognising the Macha heather stock moving reciprocal relationship? Did you get that? Quite. It's, why the... Okay, why the... Yeah, okay. I think, in, in two words, um, ignorance and arrogance. Um, I think ignorance because they don't understand the system. Um, I think arrogance because they think it's impoverished and not worth, not worth preserving, is, is, is my honest answer. And that is not just, um, that's not just, that's obviously my opinion, but it's not just that, it's not based that. Brian Wilson touched upon that yesterday, and Brian was in the corridors of power, who knows. But actually, it's very recently, just in the last um, few, few months, the, the, the government papers from that period have now been released for public access. And they show in black and white that, that civil servants briefed against all the recommendations of the Socksmith report. We have, we have a, somebody in this room who was on the Socksmith committee who can answer some of these things afterwards. But basically, they, they argued that it was too difficult, too complex, not really important, not a vote winner, not enough to galvanise people with these things, and therefore should just be sidelined. It was deliberately, deliberately watered down, despite the fact that politicians initially had a great support for the idea and crofters had a great support for the idea. The idea for, we need in the crofting communities a strong association for crofting, 
a voice for crofting. I said the SCU, when it came on there, exploded on the scene and changed the way that people thought. It was within months that people like SNH, um, people, people like um, uh, housing agencies and so on, beat a path to the, the, to the door of the ACU. You say, we want to talk to you guys because you are part of the solution. And we began to talk about these things in a way they had never been discussed before. You dismiss that because that is something that you don't understand and therefore it's too difficult. Crofting law, I've often been told, is so complex. The classic, the classic um, is that James Shaw Grant definition of a croft is a, is a small piece of land surrounded by legislation. And it's only partly a myth because it is very complex, but no more complex than tax law, no more complex than divorce law, no more complex than Brexit law, right? So let's come out of the a cupboard and look at these things in more detail with an informed view. And that view can be better informed in a dispersed, localised, um, nuanced way, rather than a blank sheet. The crofting, and the crofting as it's done in Shetland is different from here. It's very similar, and there are, there are continuities. Um, my own mother's family is from Orkney. They're much more crofters, and they, are much more, they were farmers, crofters, uh, and they're much more farm-like, they're bigger, they're better land, they're flatter and so on, they're not the bog and rock that we have in, in, uh, in places like North Harris and so on, you know. Um, but the idea behind that is that there's a continuity for the crofting community, the people who were there, and it gave them the roots into that place. That's what's important. And the reason it was dismissed was because it was too much hassle. It, it actually put power away from the centre and released into the hands. It's in the crofting interest to have a strong crofting association and a strong crofting commission, crofters commission. A crofters commission which doesn't just regulate, as it does just now, and that poorly, by the way, regulate, but also proactively develops. When we lost the HIDB and we went to HIE and its so-called market-led growth, yeah, right. Who's, who, who, who's, who's buying on the door for the markets for Crofts? It's a, it's a hand-to-mouth existence in those cases to try and make ends meet to make these things work. When we lost that, we lost the, the central government um, avenue for pushing crofting forward. There is a crofters member as of right on the Scottish Land Court, a gallant speaking member of the court, because in those days when it was set up, they didn't trust the landlords, quite rightly, so they insisted on a Gaelic-speaking member of the land court. And there's loads of stories in addition to that that I can't tell you when it's been recorded. Not rank because we're running out of time. So, um, look, that, that, that's, that's brilliant. Thanks very much, Frank, for a really passionate and powerful start to the day. So can we thank Frank for that? Okay, so uh, uh, you may wonder why I'm not saying a great deal in advance about each speaker, but that's because you have with you, or you should have on paper, the biographies of, of, of our speakers. And for folks online, I understand there's a link to uh, the, the list of speakers and all their various accomplishments before uh, they came here today. Um, so they, I'm not being disrespectful to anybody. It's just, it's just to get through the, through the business and to allow as much time as we can for speakers. So um, our next... Um, group of speakers um, are going to be talking about a survey of good health and sustainability and that's a trio of Professor John Gillis who is again well known in these parts, um, Jessica Wood who is a PhD student I think, have you finished your PhD yet? Just started it, Just started it. oh well, um, and um, Hugh Robertson who is a local councillor. Um, okay so We've got you, Jessica. What about your colleagues? Are they? Are they on? They're on. They're online. Okay, right. So how am I going to do this? Um, let's start. Jo John. Yes. Okay. Sorry, I didn't. I haven't understood what's happening here. Um, okay, John. Could you welcome to Stornoway um, via your link? I guess you're in. I don't know where you are, but Edinburgh possibly. But anyway, can welcome. Um, let's hear you tell us what your group is going to be arguing today. 
Well, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Right. Perhaps. Right. Uh, well, Martin Brahe will have done you. I guess I'm going to do it now. Now he'll hear the extraordinary and Jew. There's gas. Will and she to Donna. I guess her own the bathic and ashic. Surely. So I'm sorry that we can't be here with you today because um, we were unable to cross the narrow stretch of water between uh, Burnley and uh, Leverborough because the, boat, the ferries were sailing. We're both, in fact, in uh, at Carnish in, in North Uist. So I'm John Gillis. For the purposes of this, the important thing is that I'm a board member of Common Echri the Tua, which will subsequently be known as Kia. Um, uh, and my my friend and colleague Ushjan Robertson is the chair of Common Equity, Ushjatua. So I'll give a brief introduction to the project. Uh, are the slides up on the screen, Jess? So can people see the slide or are they just seeing me? Yes, they're up on the screen right now. Right. Okay. So this this project is initiated by Kia and ably supported by University of Aberdeen, Leah Jess, and Gordon Wells of the University of the Highlands and Islands, and the Gwyn Man Ilan project, uh, which is a website which is well worth a visit. Basically, it represents a novel way of working between the community organizations and the academic community in which the, the community itself takes the lead. And we have a definition of community there. Community and extended family will always be there to help you. The name of the project is Aya Ersun, which means really attention to well-being. And it's about it's the results of a survey taken a last year exploring community well-being, heritage, and sustainability. So next slide, please. So have we got the next slide up, uh, yes. Jess? Yes, we do. <laughs> so why did this project happen? Well, the COVID pandemic was a challenge to all of us, and Keith initiated some projects in US to support community members. Some of them were illustrated here. The telephone tree was basically a system for ringing isolated individuals in the community on a regular basis to help reduce isolation. A, the, the primary school, Scholuish Jatua, and the secondary school, Scholle and the Klet, were involved in the, the primary children were putting doing illustrations of what the, what was happening to them during the during the lockdown, and, and the secondary school pupils made a film, and you can see a line of socks by Effie Ann there. That's important because. Community means doing things for other people, and I think she was pleased to make the socks, and people were pleased to receive the socks. So the details of these and other things will be on the website, which is currently under revision. So the core of the project uh, was, is the next slide up, uh, Jess? Yes. Fine, thank you. <laughs> project was a survey circulated to the North Uist community with, a, with help from our research partners. Uh, St Andrews were also involved on the digital side, but we don't have time to report on that today. It was funded by the Ideas Fund through a grant programme a, a, run by the British Science Association and funded by the Wellcome Trust. And the project aims are listed there. Um, and it was about founded on well-being, learning how current well-being activities could be improved by working with partners, looking at recent research into the community here in Uyushitua on the use of the Gaelic language and how that could be enriched. And also the digital side, exploring how virtual reality can help our local sense. And look at how their community could use these pilot schemes to shape the development of Skolkarnish. Skolkarnish is the primary school which has been purchased by Komenekri Uyushtitua as a base for the future. So, Shinev Vuam, now can move on to Jess to explain the project in more depth. Thank you, Jess. Thank you. And next slide, please. 
Thank you. Thank you, uh, Tathlad, uh, John, for that. Um, so for the next four slides, oh, sorry, thank you. <laughs> for the next four slides, I'll provide a very condensed overview of the work um, that was conducted um, through the University of Aberdeen um, by myself um, and supervised by Dr. Heather May Morgan, who's not with us today, um, in, from the Applied Health Sciences in Aberdeen. Um, so this timeline um, depicts uh, phase one work, which was principally involved the development of a community wellbeing survey, um, from early workshop exploratory work to supporting uh, the interpretation of the findings from the survey results. Um, and we hope to touch on briefly as well as part of this presentation today, uh, plans for the phase two of the project. Um, next slide, please. So working with community members um, as co-researchers were central to the work. Um, and this um, was really important um, to have in place from the onset. And we therefore devised a series of community workshops to essentially tease out what the term well-being meant for community members and to see what questions to add to our survey. And as researchers, we were also acutely aware that the term well-being is quite an abstract one. And it was really, we wanted to break that down and to reflect the lived experience of the community. Next slide, please. So in our first workshop, we explored the definitions of well-being together and invited discussions, including considering other ways to describe well-being. We also asked attendees to bring in objects that were important to them or something that encapsulated what well-being meant to them. You can see here some of the examples on the slide. Attendees shared stories of the objects as well in a small, intimate group setting that engendered the ability to share personal stories. And as part of the workshop, a word association exercise was also conducted, associated with the objects that people brought in. And this was inspired by emotional touch point um, work that Dewar and colleagues conducted, looking at key words in hospital care settings and allowing a tapping into experiences. One of the unintended outcomes of the first workshop as well was that it acted like an, as an icebreaker for us. It was the first time I'd met the Common Estuary community members in person. All of, uh, prior to this, all of our communication had been on Zoom and via email. So it really helped with building trust and forming relationships with each other. Again, a really important part of uh, collaborative work in community projects, which uh, will be a running theme of this presentation. Next slide, please. In our second workshop, um, this was informed by a systematic review that was conducted by a master's student from the University of Aberdeen. You can see a screenshot of it at the top, on the top right there. So the presentation um, in the start of workshop two summarised um, the, the wellbeing measures identified in the review that had been used in previous co-design community work that looked at measure, measuring and evaluating community activities um, related to promoting wellbeing. And this included both qualitative methods, such as the use of photo voice, audio narr narratives, interviews, focus groups, diaries, and other, and, and other mediums such as artwork and participant observation. And some of the quanti quantitative measures, including the use of subjective well-being measurements. And these are questions developed by psychologists. Um, and this was the main focus um, of our workshop in workshop two, um, because we wanted to incorporate one of these uh, within our survey. So there were 15 um, subjective wellbeing measurements identified in the survey, um, and our student scored these on 11 attributes. And the five that scored the highest were then presented in the community wellbeing workshop. And these included the Eurohis Qual 8, the Personal Wellbeing Index, Satisfaction with Lifestyle, and the Warwick Edinburgh uh, scale, both the 14 item and the shorter item one. And we also included uh, a tool identified in the review that the growth and empowerment measurement tool that was first used and developed in Australia with indigenous communities and had more recently been further developed and refined with First Nations in Canada. So we printed out the five that scored the highest um, of the subjective wellbeing measurements identified and the adapted growth empowerment measurement as well that I mentioned and created cards with each of the questions so community members could review them within the workshops we discussed together the pros and cons of each of the statements, and, we also, and I also noted down people's reactions and likes and dislikes to these. And you can see um, people having a look at these in, in that picture there. 
um, through the workshops and through further ones following these first two key areas were identified as potential community priorities for our survey. And these included heritage, culture, land and sea, community, spirituality, Gaelic and, the local, um, and local consultation. And the chosen uh, subjective wellbeing measure that following the, the workshops was the, the short um, Warwick Edinburgh scale. Next slide, please. So as per uh, the timeline that I'd, uh, slide that I'd presented earlier, the survey was tri then trialled and then launched in October 2022 and analysed and presented to, to the Community Wellbeing Group for further analysis together in March 2023. And on this slide here, you can see a summary, a very concise <laughs> summary of the results. So we had a sample of 83 um, and a slightly higher completion rate. People could choose to complete paper or online. So you can see we just had a slightly higher completion online there. For, for what uh, is the importance of North East Heritage um, in your life, more than one response could be selected and 44% selected North East Heritage as an important part of my life. 55% selected and worried that North East heritage will get lost and should be promoted more on the islands. For, question, for, for the question, what's the importance of North East culture in your life? More than one response again could be selected. 50% selected North East culture is important to my life and 52% selected and worried that North East culture will get lost and should be promoted more on the islands. Um, for both of these, um, it's also worth acknowledging that um, we did, it wasn't just a representation from people that grew up with North East heritage and culture in their life, but also those that hadn't, that recognised the importance of it and also had concerns for the potential loss. So that was an unexpected finding from our survey. For what the importance of North East land and sea environment in your life, um, only one response could be selected and 92% selected that it was important to very important. We also invited respondents to give examples of the activities they conducted in the environment and also to document any concerns they had. And you can see here on the top right in the word cloud some of the responses we received. Um, and the ones that are in the larger font are the ones obviously that they were most frequently discussed. So coastal erosion, concerns relating to the macker, climate change, changes to crofting were the most frequently expressed concerns which is probably not surprising given our last talk as well. Um, with what is the importance of community in our life, 92% selected, import, it was important to very important. And respondents again were invited to share the importance of community in their lives. And uh, this is just one of the, the quotes we've got here. And um, on the title um, page that um, John had started with, there was another of those quotes from that section presented. For what was the importance of spirituality in your life? Responses again were posed um, in a Lickart scale of importance with 50% selecting was important to very important. For the question relating to local consultation, we had a lot of discussion about how to present this and we decided that we required two sub questions to be posed in relation to this. The first related to local concerns being heard at regional and national levels, and the second related to being fully consulted on regional and national decisions that impacted locally. So again, um, only one response could be provided, and it was a five-point Lickert scale of agreement from strongly disagree to strongly agree with the statement. So for our concerns are being heard at regional and national level, 69% selected disagree to strongly disagree to the statement. And four, we are being fully consulted on regional and national decisions that impact us locally. 72% selected disagree to strongly dis disagree with this statement. For both questions, again, respondents were invited to comment on their concerns. And concerns, which again would not be a surprise for many people in the audience today, included transport, housing, healthcare, Gaelic policy, and concerns related to the planned spaceport in North East. There was also a sense of lack of meaningful consultation when it did happen and engagement with the local communities. And finally, before I move uh, on to our, our, our other co-speaker, uh, the responses to uh, the, war the short uh, Warwick Edinburgh wellbeing measure uh, chosen for the survey was 71. So there was a slight drop from our sample size, um, but it's worth noting that everyone responded to all the questions within our survey. 
An overall median score, score of 23.21 was calculated, and this is in line with the English control group provided from the um, subjective wellbeing measure, measurement guidance on interpreting, interpreting the results. It's worth noting that we did receive a free text box feeding back regarding feeling uncomfortable with the personal questions posed, which is something that should be perhaps considered another community evaluative work where more for uh, perhaps overt means may not necessarily be appropriate. And it's certainly fed into some of the feedback um, that we received from that workshop too when we were looking at the, the different wellbeing measurement statements. I'm now going to pass on to Ustin, who will present the findings on Gaelic from the community survey, and he'll also discuss the Gaelic sessions of phase one that were facilitated uh, by Gordon of uh, Gordon Wells, sorry, of UHI through Island Voices. Next slide, please. Yes. Yeah, we can see you. Yeah, Cleva. Matina Akkad in this war pick in this case that showed you a bit better weather today, and I'm sorry we couldn't be there with you uh, yesterday and today. I think we would have, would have enjoyed being part of the uh, gathering, but island life, I'm afraid. To you, looking at this slide, the results of the survey are very encouraging at various community events, Kupanekayanish, Gaelic Cafe, and your soon events, Attitude to Gaelic, were hugely positive amongst the community, and they have overwhelmingly agreed that Gaelic is important to the community. If I were to pick out one aspect of the survey, it is the importance of using Gaelic in a community setting. My own sister works full-time as a home carer, and I see on a daily basis how important it is for some service users to have a Gaelic speaker coming into their home and able to communicate in Gaelic, and that gives them a lot of comfort. And I can't stress enough how important that is to some of the service users. I was fortunate enough myself during my high school days in Inverness to have two great Gaelic teachers, Lachie Dick and Duncan Macquarie, and they certainly gave me a good grounding in Gaelic grammar. However, if we look closely at what is being said in my particular community, there is a big need with garlic in used amongst our young people. Like several others in the community, I would like to do more to be able to help uh, people in the community who are le learners and to be able to encourage them. I got that opportunity myself during COVID when a family member was looking for some help mm -hmm. online. So I started doing that. At that time, he was uh, on primary seven, actually, in Scholage de Tour. He had been clearly encouraged by his mother and father, neither, unfortunately, Gaelic speakers. But over the last two or three years, he has become very fluent in Gaelic. It became clear to me at that time how quickly they can pick up Gaelic in, at that age. And it's a shame we can't do this on a more regular basis, as many people in the community would be able to help in such a situation. I note, of course, going back several years, references from some of my own cousins in their 30s and 40s, who very much regret they weren't encouraged by their own parents to go through garlic medium education. And nowadays, with kids of their own, they are doing just that. There are, however, situations where one parent or both no garlic, but don't use it in the home, and that's a crying shame. If we can move on to the second slide, uh, Jess. Ready? Yeah. Yeah. We talk about what does success look like, but should we be asking what does success sound like? Signage and writing, etc., will not keep garlic alive if it's not spoken. People understand the value of the language in terms of culture, heritage, music, and so on, but I am not so sure that the general public understand the economic value of the Gaelic language. If you leave Gaelic to a community alone, it will be dead in a few years. It is necessary for public bodies to show leadership in the matter, have policies that make it easier for employees to work in wider spheres of work, Areas where garlic is important and make a concerted effort to help develop their skills. It's good enough to talk about different plans, but a plan and strategy are of no use unless it's proof that they have an effect. 
revising our human resources practices for recruitment and selection, and asking to admit formally to Gaelic learning opportunities at interview, and providing quality pathways for learners would help solve the Gaelic essential and desirable issue. This would also address issues of equity, inclusion, merit, etc. We need to be proactive in growing our own bilingual workforce across the piste and not limit Gaelic's relevance to any particular sectors of posts. Hard data shows the effectiveness of eScol, but it is difficult to see how effective funding has proved in other areas that have been advancing Gaelic calls. There is clear support for more public and support services to be made available in Gaelic. We are not doing enough in the island to promote garlic or the value of it as an, econ as an economic and social asset. There is a need for proper support for the garlic learner experience. We need for more services to be available in garlic. There is a lack of promotion of the economic benefits of garlic. Visitors want to hear it as it is spoken colloquially and learn it. There ought to be garlic jobs in tourism, nursing, hospitality, the media, shops, and more. Getting garlic cared and not merely preserved in all the organizations and institutions is key. More importantly, this would be a very powerful message for career pathways for parents considering garlic medium and for pupils already in the system. I feel that certain groups seem to get a higher priority in getting funding than others from the Scottish Government and Port of Garlic. In terms of our own commonality, which is a strong garlic ethos, we certainly feel that we are at the tail end of what might be a garlic funding prioritisation matrix, and I'm stealing this term from my favourite organisation, CalMAC. There is a current discussion on areas of linguistic significance, and we await with interest the outcomes of these discussions. Some of the cynics amongst us say that this has, read, has already been decided. I certainly hope not. Can we move on to the third, the next slide, Jess? Ready? Ready? Yeah, okay. Thank you. In the recorded discussions, participants chose a Gaelic clip they wished to watch or listen to from Gwyn and Nila, or in this particular case, Topol and Dwolchus. They then discussed it. The recorded clip and discussion on Zoom were placed on the Island Voices YouTube channel with closed caption subtitles, enabling viewers to switch the Gaelic subtitles on or off. The YouTube settings will further enable machine translation of the subtitles, so non-speakers of garlic should still be able to follow the gist of the conversation in the language of their choice, including English. This functionality allows garlic speakers to conduct a conversation on their own terms in garlic without necessarily feeling they are excluding non-garlic speaking friends, neighbours or indeed family members from the exchange. That's the theory. In practice, it depends on participants feeling at ease about being recorded, on familiarity with online platforms such as Zoom and YouTube that enables this functionality on, on decent broadband connectivity to their own home. I mean, one of the discussions we had, funnily enough, was about coastal erosion. Uh, recording from the early 1950s, and it was interesting then to notice, of course, that uh, it was a concern even then in, in certain areas of North Hewist. Um, I think the thing that we had a problem with on this particular recording was uh, some of us, a large group of us were in the room in the school and others were online. And I, th I always feel it's better to have either one or the other. I think when you've got both, it doesn't work quite as well. Anyway, to sum up, uh, on, on what Gordon said. Gordon stressed the intact value of various recording collections, uh, noting in particular how open resources such as Topol and Dwochus have the potential to bring present and past communities together in a manner to support North Hewist cultural well-being, offering innovative ways of forward-looking engagement with the island's Gaelic heritage. 
so positively valued by all. At the same time, it needs to be recognized that community-wide engagement in such activity is dependent on community-wide comfort with the new digital tools that enable it. This is probably an area of work that needs closer attention. Thank you, Jess, and that's me. Yeah, sorry, next slide, please. Sorry, thank you, Easton. Um, so through the above work, I hope uh, we've been able to demonstrate how co-research work can be facilitate, facilitated sorry, and how being led by community was very central and enriching to the development of the wellbeing survey, but also in the community discussions within the Gaelic sessions as well. In phase two, we're orientated uh, towards the qualitative research methods for um, evaluating wellbeing activities and through, and through a community ethnography that will be led by um, our community, one of our community researchers, Mary Morrison. Um, this will enable us to tease out the links um, of the key areas that we identified in our initial community wellbeing workshops and in our survey findings and observe how they play out in the day-to-day uh, through a series of community events and this work will culminate uh, in a community mural that will then be thematically analysed. So to conclude, the methodology has been challenging but greatly rewarding, grounded in mutual respect and understanding and ensuring community island voices are heard. We liken the community researchers as a type of apprenticeship of becoming a researcher, of an embodied and skilled practice where observers and practitioners enter empathetic relations with each other. We have very much made our own community of practice of a shared knowledge between the co-researchers in the project, project sorry, and I have no doubt um, that this collaborative work has also contributed to our own senses of well-being. So um, I'll just leave you now with some key references. Next slide, please. Um, and then next slide, uh, contact information. Um, if you wanted to know a bit more about the ongoing project and also some of the other activities that the North East Historical Society are conducting. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jessica and Hugh and John. Um, have they now disappeared? No. no. All good. Great. Brilliant. Wonderful. So we okay. can have questions to either either of our three speakers. Um, so questions, comments. You got one, Des? Yeah. Thanks very much. So, um, to all of you, really, what was the big surprise in your findings? What was very unexpected? And therefore, can we use that to think about how we, we sort of develop the, the methodology we're using going ahead? Who wants to answer that? It, Okay, gentlemen, one of you can correspond to that, it'd be great. D did you hear the question, which was, was in, in all of this work, what, what was or what were any surprises that um, came along the way as your inquiries were going on? I'm not sure we had any surprises at such, you know, we got the usual, you know, coastal erosion, environment, so on and so forth. I mean, as I said earlier, I was particularly encouraged with the support for garlic in the community from both uh, fluent speakers and uh, learners. I thought, uh, you know, I, I feel kind of guilty myself in not over the past several years doing more on this. And uh, I think uh, I, I need to play, you know, I've been so heavily involved in all the transport issues over the last several years that I've mm. kind of... Uh, probably sideline this to a degree and I think both within the community setting and with a, within my own work as vice chair of Garley Committee of the Corla, I think we need to be doing a lot more work and I think the Corla itself needs to be doing better in relation to the promotion of garlic. Mm -hmm. Can I just add to that? I think that the other thing, that perhaps not a surprise, but just the way it's, just the extent to which um, people thought that their concerns were not being heard at regional and national level and that there was a lack of meaningful engagement and, and tokenism. And I think that's something that we often hear about, but actually this is evidence that the community feels 
that this is what is happening. And I think that's a very significant thing, both for both for the Corlea and for uh, and for uh, national governments, both UK and Scottish governments as well, mm. and is not to be disregarded. Yeah, I think that's a theme that's that's coming across. Yes, um, there's one in the. Thank you, Jessica and colleagues, for that wonderful talk. Very inspiring. Uh, again, it's, it's a very important topic, Jessica, for your, your PhD, so I wish you the best of success with that. There's a, an obvious tension in the results in relation to uh, Gaelic affairs that it's quite clear there are very positive aspirations. It's, it's, they're indicating how important it is to their personal and local identity. But there's also there's a gap there between the level of aspiration on the one hand, which is positive, and then the shortcomings or the drawback, the drawbacks of the current policy framework for Gaelic affairs. Are there what are the ideas that are coming up in the community to bridge that gap between aspirations and the strategic failures in the current system? Who's going to deal with that? I think okay. one of my own frustrations, you know, in terms of Comunerte, which, you know, has, has uh, 16 trustees, and I think of the 16, 14 are fluent Gaelic speakers. You know, we are, of course, uh, uh, you know, a, a community. We don't have paid employees, I'm afraid. And I think we tend to lose out to... Uh, uh, community groups that do have paid employees and can put forward a very good bid in for garlic funding, for example. You know, uh, they can tick the right boxes. We get caught up in running events of the hugely onerous process of, of accreditation we have to go through for Museums Gallery Scotland. So we don't have, I feel, the skill set or the time uh, to progress, you know, some of the garlic projects which do need funding. You know, we need to, we need to fund the school to keep it open as well. So, I, I just feel that that more attention needs to be given to voluntary good groups with a strong garlic ethos and recognise that they don't have the maybe the people or the skill set to put forward very good. Uh, 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 applications for funding and I think we've fallen down on that and I think we need to look at where the funding goes and I think uh, quite a bit of funding has come into the uh, North Uist from Borsham Garlic and Scottish Government but I feel it's gone to the wrong places and I'm not seeing any positive outcomes from that funding and I think that needs to change going forward if we are to protect the garlic in our particular community. Okay, so thanks very much. I, I am lost because my paper, have you got my papers, Jessica? But anyway, because I think we're, I think it's time to, 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 to thank you for that, uh, for the three of you for your contributions, Jessica. I hope you're, uh, well, I hope the PhD goes well and um, I look forward to hearing more about that in due course. So thank you very much, the three of you. That's great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we're now um, at 10, 20, 20, 25, and it's time for coffee, and we shall, I think coffee is next door? Yeah, yeah okay, next door, and if we can come back by 10.45, that would be brilliant. So thanks very much, see you then.
Okay, ready to go. Okay, folks, let's. I um, hope you enjoyed your coffee and tea and biscuits and conversation. Um, I enjoyed mine. I've learned a lot about um, uh, from the gentleman there who um, is involved with the lifeboats. Um, and and, and uh, goodness me, I'm confused. But you use so many titles of organisations and so forth. But but you, another passionate individual. <laughs> anyway, right. Let's get on with the rest of this morning session. And this, the next speaker is is um, David McLennan, who has been involved in nature conservation in Scotland for a long time, and he is currently head of operations in uh, West uh, in operations West for Nature Scotland. And he's going to be talking to us about overcoming the climate nature, sorry, the climate nature crisis. Yeah, so thanks very much, David. I need to put it up a little bit. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chris, and uh, good morning. And thanks for uh, inviting me uh, to come along and speak to you today. Uh, Des actually asked me last June uh, over a cup of coffee in North Harris uh, if I'd be uh, interested in participating in this event and coming along and speaking about the nature and climate crisis and what it might, might mean for us in the islands. I mean, needless to say, I was very pleased to accept the challenge. Uh, and if I'd come along and spoken to you last June, uh, what I would say would be quite different, I think, to what I'm going to outline this morning. And that's because so much has changed just in the course of the last year. Uh, the whole field of climate change and uh, nature uh, loss is rapid. Uh, we're seeing change and we'll continue to see change in, in how these things develop. So what I go through today will look quite different next year. Uh, and I think that's part of the challenge that we all face uh, with dealing with these issues. I really uh, enjoyed everything that I've heard so far uh, in this event. And I mean, there's some really common themes that I think are coming out of what everybody's saying uh, around community empowerment and getting benefits for the community, um, the value of our natural resources, whether that's wind, and the potential for renewable energy generation in the islands, uh, our, our peatlands, I'll come on to, um, and the way that our land is used. Um, another key thing that came through was the, the importance of having policies that are fit for the islands and for the people who live in the islands. Uh, and I think that that's certainly come across loud and clear from everybody who's spoken. This morning, I'm going to People have talked about multi-activities. Uh, I've got three hats on this morning. I've always got more than one hat. Uh, I do work for Nature Scott. I am a manager within Nature Scott. I also, uh, I'm, I think today I'm representing our Outer Hebrides Community Planning Partnership, so all of the public bodies in the Outer Hebrides, uh, where my climate change interest really comes in. Um, but I'm also, like others, uh, a member, a chair of a grazings committee. So I'm a, I've got a direct interest in how our land is managed uh, in Lewis. So I shall try to flip between the right hats at the right time, but excuse me if I don't. So uh, I think the first thing to, before we get into the island situation, climate change is a global issue. And it's really important that we understand the context that we're working within. Um, this graph, many of you, I'm sure, will have seen something similar to this. This, this shows uh, how our climate has been warming uh, since the, the, the 1850, pre-industrial times. And what we can see clearly, if I get this to work, uh, where we are just now, uh, the last nine years have been the nine warmest years on record. Um, where we are in terms of last year, globally, uh, we touched over 1.5 degrees more than 
uh, pre-industrial levels. Now, 1.5 degrees is an important figure. It's what the Paris Agreement sets out that we need to try to uh, make sure that we don't go beyond 1.5 degrees. Uh, otherwise, we're going to see more significant uh, changes in our climate. The Paris Agreement is over a 10-year average. So although we hit it last year, it doesn't mean we've, tr we've triggered that yet. But what this is telling us is we're getting there. Uh, and it's something that we need to be concerned about. So we all know that we're in a climate and nature crisis. And the stats tell us that. What this figure is showing, it's a, it's a little bit messy, but um, there are eight different scenarios that have been modelled on how our climate is changing. If we want to keep below the 1.5 degree scenario, uh, we need to cut our emissions and we need to cut them fast. Where we are at the moment, globally, uh, if all the promises that all countries have already said they're going to honour happen, this is the track that we're on. Sort of closer to a three degree increase in temperature globally, well beyond what the Paris Agreement has asked us to look at. And the UK Climate Change Committee has advised that uh, when we're looking at how we plan for the future with respect to climate change, we should be planning for a two degree increase, not 1.5. We should be planning for that. Um, but we also need to be looking at what a four degree increase might mean for us. Uh, so it's, it's a stark situation that we're in. So what's happening about it? Uh, well, in Scotland, uh, in 2019, Scotland was one of the first countries to declare a climate emergency, uh, recognising the need for urgent action to take place. And Scotland uh, has led the way by setting ambitious targets uh, to d achieve net zero by 2045. Uh, there has been good progress made with reducing emissions. Something like 50% of our emissions have been cut since 1990, which sounds good, but there's an awful lot more that needs to be done. And I'm sure you'll have heard in the news this week uh, that the, climate, the UK's Climate Change Committee has stated that uh, Scotland's aims of reducing emissions by 75% by 2030 are, in their words, beyond what's credible. It's not going to happen. We're not getting there. We're not moving fast enough. Um, government's response is that, you know, they recognise how uh, difficult the challenge is, but remain committed to delivering the target by 2045. It's a challenge. But it's not just climate that I'm speaking to you about, uh, nature as well. Mm -hmm. The State of Nature report for Scotland for 2023 sets out some, again, worrying statistics. 15% um, decline in species abundance in Scotland since 1994. That's not good. A 57% decrease in plant and lichen distribution since 1970. That's, that's really worrying, and it really highlights. I've heard people talking about protected areas and not protected areas and corn crakes, for example. We need to look at this across the landscape. It's not about a little bit here and a little bit there. Nature's in crisis, and we need to look at it at a landscape scale. We've seen our seabirds decline. 49% decline in seabirds since 1986. That's really visible here with the seabird uh, islands that we have around the Outer Hebrides. Uh, these figures don't even take account of bird flu. Uh, so that, that figure, while stark, is worse than, than what we're seeing there. So uh, we need to be mindful of that. And a really worrying stat, 11% uh, of our species are at risk of extinction. We think about pandas <laughs> when we talk about uh, extinction of species, but this is an issue, and it's an issue in Scotland, and things like chuff and capercaillie are just hanging on by a thread. Uh, and we, we need to do something about that. So our ecosystems are uh, degraded. Some, some of our ecosystems are degraded. So. As well as being poor for biodiversity, they're also less resilient to climate change. 
So they're less able to respond when we get shocks to the system through things like floods, fires, droughts, uh, uh, other, other pest species and such like. So whilst we're thinking about climate, we also need to uh, tackle the nature crisis. They're linked. The draft Scottish Biodiversity Strategy, which is the, the, the strategy will be published later this year, uh, it's got a, a useful graphic, Des might know a fair bit about this, uh, which tries to set out how things have changed since the, since the 70s. Um, the strategy is aiming to, to, to stop the loss of biodiversity by 2030 and restore nature uh, by 2045. And we can see from the 70s how land use, sea use, uh, has resulted in a loss of bi biodiversity and if we change, there's a lot of things that we need to tackle to make this change. Uh, but if we do, uh, we can restore nature by 2045. Um, when the strategy is published, it will be accompanied by a, a detailed delivery plan that sets out what the priority actions are uh, and how they will be achieved. So why, I mean, why, are, why have we seen this loss of biodiversity? There's, a number of, there's never a simple, single answer to any of these things. It's complicated. But the key reasons behind uh, why we are where we are today include uh, how we've changed the way we use our land, intensive use of land, how we've, we've exploited nature, what we've taken out, uh, pollution, Huge issue globally, and uh, you know, Blue Planet has highlighted that and put it to everybody's uh, thinking. Invasive non-native species. Uh, we've got big problems with invasive non-native species in Scotland and in the islands in particular. We're trying to tackle them, but they have a huge impact on nature. And climate change uh, and how that's uh, affecting things. So the two things are linked. You can't separate them. Uh, having a healthy natural environment uh, makes the whole place more resilient to climate change. Uh, but climate change, as it, as it happens, and as I was saying about, uh, we don't know exactly what's going to happen over the course of the next 50 years, but the more that global temperatures increase, the more negative impacts we can see from climate change on nature. So that's trying to set the sort of global challenge that we have. Um, so what does that mean for us here in the Outer Hebrides? The, as I said, the Scottish Government declared a climate emergency in 2019. And pretty much at the same time, uh, I was at a community planning partnership meeting in Stornoway and uh, it was at a time when the school strikes were happening and we had school children standing outside the council building in Stornoway saying, you know, this is real, this affects us uh, and something needs to be done about it. So at the community planning partnership meeting, under any other business, uh, somebody said, I think we should declare a climate emergency. So, you know, we thought this, this matter needs a little bit more consideration than two seconds under any other business. So what the Community Planning Partnership decided to do was instead of just saying uh, we're going to declare a climate emergency, we set up a working group uh, with broad representation from public bodies uh, in the Outer Hebrides. And we've been working closely with Adaptation Scotland working towards developing plans for climate change and what it's going to mean for people in the Outer Hebrides. The work that we started in 2019 ground to a bit of a halt in 2020. COVID's been mentioned several times. So our aims to engage with communities uh, as part of the development of our work was, was stifled, but not stopped. We managed to keep going. Um, and significant progress has been made. What we've pulled together is the Outer Hebrides Climate Rationale, which is available online. Uh, it's, um, it's, what we've done is we've pulled together all of the scientific information that we could access for the Outer Hebrides. 
uh, and set out uh, what it actually means for, for us in terms of how climate change can Im impact on people, uh, the environment and our economy. This isn't Nature Scott's climate rationale. This is the Community Planning Partnerships document. And I think that's really important because climate change isn't anyone's problem. It's everyone's problem. And the only way that we can work on it is by working together. So the rationale sets out what, again, this has been worked up through uh, a wide range of organizations and, and people in the community. Um, our challenge in the Outer Hebrides is that regardless of what happens globally, we're still going to see the impacts of climate change. Even if 1.5 degrees was successful, and it doesn't look like it's going to be, we are still going to see climate change impacting on the Outer Hebrides. So we need to plan for that. Uh, we need to, to look ahead. We need to reduce our emissions. But we need to think about how we need to change uh, to be more resilient to the effects of climate change. I mean, look around, look around the world. We, we, we see floods, we see fires, we see glaciers retreating. It, it's, it's happening. Look at the UK. Look at the heat waves that we had uh, last summer. We didn't get a heat wave in the Outer Hebrides, but the rest of the UK got it. Uh, look outside. No. Look at what's happened to this event. Uh, we're seeing an increased frequency in gales, in storm events, which are affecting day-to-day -day life, like this event right now. In December in Egypt, uh, the COP28 discussed global progress and, and response to climate change. Again, it's happening every year. Um, we're making slow progress globally. There are, there are, of course, huge issues globally that are affecting how things are happening, including the cost of living. It's been mentioned several times. Conflict in Ukraine, uh, pandemics, massive challenges that are happening globally. But climate change is probably the biggest one, affecting everybody. And we really need to make progress uh, on how we respond to that challenge. On Thursday this week, there was a COP event in Uist, which pulled together people in Uist to talk about what was happening with respect to climate change. I couldn't go. And I understand that some representatives from Lewis who went are still in Uist. Um, but we're also planning to hold a COP event for the Outer Hebrides later this year. It's under development now. Uh, so watch this space. I think that will be a, a useful uh, thing to take forward. So what, are, what can we expect to see? Uh, the projections for Scotland are that, uh, a number, I, I'm not going to read them all out, but warmer, drier summers, warmer, wetter winters, uh, sea level rise. Sea level rise is a huge issue. Uh, we're looking at potentially seeing uh, an, an increase of relative sea level rise uh, in the Outer Hebrides of around about a metre over the course of the next 100 years. Think hard about that one. Um, we need to, to think what that means for us and how we respond to that. The Met Office have been part of our working group and it's been great to have them on board. Uh, so they've, they've given us special treatment and uh, using their modeling and their, their computers, they've, they've been looking at what the, the projections are likely to be for the Outer Hebrides. And what we're anticipating seeing is may, maybe not more severe gale storm events. We've had them before. We will have them again, but maybe not an increase in the frequency of those, but an increase in the frequency of that <laughs> that's happening outside that window right now is what the Met Office is predicting we're likely to see in the Outer Hebrides. And if we do see uh, temperatures increasing beyond 1.5 degrees, we can expect to see more chaos in weather systems and more unpredictability in weather systems. So the work that we've done through the Community Planning Partnership and through engaging with people um, 
has identified some high-level risks. I'm not going to go into them in detail, but it just gives you a feel for, for the kind of things we need to be prepared to, to respond to. Risks to lives from floods. We've already seen the loss of lives from floods in, in the Outer Hebrides, and it's something that is really core to any conversation that we have around this issue uh, when we go out to speak to communities. It's likely to have an impact on, on economic activities, uh, infrastructure, uh, landslides. We've seen several, we see more of them. I remember seeing one with you, David, sitting in the Harris Hotel one afternoon. We can expect to see more of that. Uh, there are risks to our, our road infrastructure, causeways, bridges, uh, health, uh, and our natural environment, our coastal habitats. Coastal erosion has come up several times in what people have been talking about. Uh, so, yeah, that there's concern about that, and there's concern about what we need to do to try to tackle all of these challenges. One of the things that we've done with our climate rationale, it's hard to visualize a lot of these things. So we've pulled together all the data sets from dynamic coast, from SEPA's flood management, flood risk modeling, um, the council's data on infrastructure, where are our roads, where are our bridges, where are our schools, we pulled it all together into one mapping package, which is available to anybody. Uh, it's, 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 it's online, you can, there's a link to it in the climate rationale. And you can, you can zoom in to anywhere in the Outer Hebrides uh, and use the layers in this map to look at what scenarios might lie ahead in the future. I say might, there's uncertainty in all of this, but it helps you to think. Uh, this is just an example which happens to be on my own doorstep. Uh, but this is uh, showing what the erosion vicinity might be like uh, in the year 2100. Now, the interesting thing here is that this is the main road that goes from Stornoway to Tolsta, uh, right in the middle of it. Uh, it's the water supply from Stornoway to Tolsta. And in this area, uh, there's a cemetery that meets the needs uh, of, of that area. So we can see 70 years ahead some, and this is just one example. We can look at this anywhere in the Outer Hebrides uh, and think about, okay, that's what the data might be telling us, so what do we do about it? This one is uh, South Uist, uh, and what we can see in this illustration is from, from CPAS data is the areas of South Uist that are prone to flooding as a result of a number of factors, which I, I'll come on to in a little bit more detail later. But it's illustrative of what the data is telling us. The other thing that we're doing right now, which I think is powerful, is we're engaging people. Uh, it's been said so many times, things that you do to people don't work, things that you do with people can work, uh, so, as well as what the scientific data is telling us, we need to know what people think. And we've managed to get resources from the Young Foundation to support the development of an interactive tool. It's called a story map, which again is available to anybody to use. And anybody can go onto this and add an entry. Uh, I can't, this is just a screenshot, so I can't demonstrate the whole thing. Uh, but anybody can put in an event that happened. It could be a picture, it could be a video, it could just be a, a statement of, of something that had happened relating to climate and what it's actually meant for people or for the community. And what we're, we've got two outreach workers at the moment, one in Euston and Barra and one in Lewis and Harris, uh, who are taking this tool and speaking to people and asking people to put in their experiences. So we're trying to capture as much real life experience from people throughout the Outer Hebrides of what they're seeing, what they're feeling, what they're experiencing. Uh, and that will be just as important for the development of plans as uh, what the scientific data is telling us. So I said I would come to Uist. Uh, 
um, because in all of our meetings, uh, in all of the engagement work, Ewes and, Ewes and Ben Bekula jump out uh, for a number of different reasons. I've already spoken about uh, the relative sea level rise and projections of a metre over the next century. Um, in South Uist and Ben Bekula, as that map that I just showed you uh, say, will, will tell us, large areas are already below the mean high water mark. No. Uh, so as sea level rises, then that becomes more of an issue. Another complicating factor in Uist is that these chaotic weather systems that we're seeing, we, we are seeing these rainstorms that dump a significant amount of rain in a short period of time. We're seeing more of them. Um, the rainfall in Uist is like, we, we like to see more events like that. The sea level is rising. South Uist and Ben Bekula have extensive drainage systems that were put in uh, in the 1850s, 1860s. The purpose of the drainage system being to take fresh water out to create agricultural land uh, for people to get benefits from, uh, which has been highly successful. But because it could let water out, when sea level rises, it can let water in. So when we look at sea level rise, the drainage system, and potential increases in rainfall, and pulling all of these things together, you see a hugely complicated picture uh, of what lies ahead uh, in, in, in the Uists in particular, which will be a key focal, focal point for whatever our adaptation plans come forwards with. But one of the things that's so, so clear in this is that uh, nature is going to be probably our best defence mechanism for these changes. So the dune system to the west of the, the US, absolutely vital form of coast protection. We need to manage that. And the, the kelp, kelp was mentioned, uh, the kelp industry. The kelp resource to the west of the US is massive. It's a huge resource, but it's also a huge coast protection resource. So we need to be sensitive to how we, uh, to how we manage our natural resources. So, trying to sort of pull all of this together is tricky. Um, to deliver net zero, the, the challenge is we, we, need to, we need to get our emissions down as far as we possibly can. Um, the data on this slide has come from a recently, it's going to be published very shortly. I have pulled together a piece of work looking at greenhouse gas emissions across the highlands and islands. Uh, it's, it's, just about to be published, but this is the raw data uh, in summary for the whole of the highlands and islands of the relative proportions of our emissions in, in different sectors. What you can, whilst we need to reduce our emissions in all of these sectors, what jumps out is that it's agriculture and land use that are the biggest sources of emissions in the highlands and islands. And if you actually dig a little bit deeper and look at the islands, that figure of approximately 50% of our emissions actually comes up to 70 to 80% of our emissions from agriculture and from land, predominantly land use and the peatland resource that we have uh, in the islands. So we need to tackle all of these things, but we need to tackle the emissions from land use. The Island Centre for Net Zero project has been set up under the Islands Deal. Uh, based, in, based in Lewis, uh, but covering all of our islands. And it's, it's looking to test, uh, to explore ideas, to test them and to accelerate uh, solutions for decarbonizing uh, in the islands, but potentially worldwide, sharing our experiences worldwide. And it's looking at things like fuel poverty, economic opp opportunities from energy, community benefits, uh, community-led change, uh, local energy markets, and uh, looking at uh, how to tackle land use-related emissions. So the, the key message in this, we heard a lot about renewables yesterday and the huge potential, which is great, but it's not the answer. 
We will not solve net zero purely with renewables. We need to do more, and you can't sort it without tackling the emissions from land use. There are things we can do, uh, which I'm getting a bit mixed. Whoops. There are things that we can do, uh, and we're well placed in, in the islands to, to make a meaningful contribution. Um, we can restore habitats uh, by putting habitats into better condition. They're more resilient and more able to respond to, to climate change. We can do it with peatlands by re-wetting them. Something like 80% of Scotland's peatlands are, are actually degraded and emitting carbon rather than storing it. So we need to do something about that. The government target is to restore 250,000 hectares by 2030. That's ambitious. We're making progress towards that, but it's ambitious. The north of Lewis has a huge resource uh, of peatland, all of it in community ownership. Um, how can we look at that and how can we accelerate progress with restoring significant proportions uh, of our land in, uh, in, in Lewis? And we've got Ben from Peatland Action here today. Agriculture. A lot of talk about crofting. Uh, crofting, by its very nature, uh, is a low-intensity form of agriculture, um, which can make a significant contribution uh, to how we use our land to contribute to restoring nature uh, and a response to climate change. We do need to recognise that uh, production of food is key in agricultural systems. So let's not lose sight of that. It's managing land purely for nature uh, and purely for a response to climate change is not the answer. We need food. So the trick in all of this is, is finding ways to support food production at the same time as restoring nature and making a contribution towards our, our climate change targets. Future agricultural support needs to recognise that and reward it. It's been looked at now, and it's really important that crofting has a key part uh, in future support systems. So, nearly finished. Uh, just restating the challenge that we have. It's a big, it's a global challenge. Uh, regardless of what we do in the Outer Hebrides, we're going to have to plan to adapt to it. There are things we can do. Uh, we can reduce our emissions. And nature has a really important part to play within that. You can't do it without nature. Um, we can take steps to adapt, but we need to take people with us. So it's really important that whatever plan comes forward is owned by the community. Uh, and the bottom line is we can't do this. We can't respond to the climate crisis unless we respond to the nature crisis at the same time. They're, they're heavily interlinked. And this is my last slide, uh, which is going back to the image in the Scottish Biodiversity Strategy, where we're aiming to restore nature by 2045. If we look to the left, uh, we see where we were with nature poor systems emitting carbon into the environment, uh, highly risky for climate impacts. And if we get to a position where nature's been restored uh, by having nature rich uh, ecosystems, they'll store carbon rather than emitting carbon and will be more resilient to the impacts of climate change that are coming our way. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much, David. Um, we're You've used a lot of time. Yeah. Let's, um, <laughs> let's, um, let's have a couple of questions. So, yes, Agnes, yes. Hi, David. Thank you so much for that uh, really inspiring talk, I would have to say. Depressing, but not mm -hmm. entirely depressing. Realistic. It's realistic, yeah. So, you mentioned specifically uh, our big bog in the north of Lewis, which, let's face it, is rich of what it is, and there's a lot of interest in it from outside. And already people are beginning to capitalise on areas of the same 
say makeup, shall we say. Is there a way that uh, we can work with our, our community land trusts, work with you and others, so that our small community businesses can be rewarded, people can be taken along with us so that they don't feel they're being dragged along and having to do something against their will, and that whatever would have been paid out to the rich man's playground could instead be used to incentivize at the local level, local led, and do what the community needs for the benefit yeah. of all. Yeah. Could there be a way? Well, there has to be a way. I think what I've illustrated is that if we don't do this, we're in serious trouble. We ha there has to be a way. Uh, and the, the, the north end of Lewis and the vast peatland resource that it has has to play a part within our response, not just in the Outer Hebrides, but the, our national and our global response. So, I mean, we've, we've got peatland action can help to a degree, uh, but in terms of the financial benefits and rewards that we'd like to see flowing into communities, um, there are opportunities to put forward proposals for restoring land. It, of course, needs contractors, it needs skills, it needs jobs uh, to be able to do all of this work. And there's a big opportunity there, too. Um, but the, 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 it is possible for uh, commu community land trusts to put forward proposals for peatland restoration uh, and to go through the route of going through the, the peatland code uh, and looking at carbon credits and such like. So that, that is there. There are complexities. Uh, between community, well, any land-owning organisation and uh, crofting. When, when we look at grazing committees and the rights of grazing committees on land, owned whether it's by a community landowner or a private landowner, how that actually works in practice, what are you actually signing up to do, uh, and how does, how, how does the financial reward for that flow between the landowner and the crofting tenants is an area that the crofting commission, I think, has responsibility to, to clarify that matter, because at the moment, I think it's a block uh, on how we can see progress in that area, not just here, but in other parts of the country. Exactly. It has to be beaten. We, we need to do it. It's kind of following on from that, and I think, I think you and I share the opinion because we've discussed that in the past, but it's worth getting out on the record. Um, one of the trigger words, another trigger word for me is rewilding. Um, and rewilding is very offensive to many people in the Highlands and Islands because it's, the land is only wild in the commas because it was cleared of people forcibly. And there's evidence to show from record that when people inhabited those glens, they were, had a greater biodiversity than there are at present. Is there a position, or, or, or how do you think the, the, the position might change if we, for example, in the north of Lewis, repositioned ourselves as ecological restoration and looked at the peat bog together with the croft land and the macher land to think about the rejuvenation of the entire area and ecological restoration. Yeah. Do you think that's a branding thing that we next might actually capture public attention and, and to challenge? I think we, we need to look at landscape scale at how we respond to the challenges that are ahead of us. And you need to look at the whole system. So, so what you've set out there, Frank, I think is absolutely uh, worth looking at and exploring. Uh, re rewilding is an emotive concept. It means different things to different people. Uh, certainly what we need to see happening. We need to see nature restored. Let's accept that. But we need to do that with people, not to the exclusion of people. Uh, so looking at, looking at the north of Lewis and, and thinking about in the, in the big picture, how, how do we pull all of this together in a way that's going to work and it's going to meet the needs of the communities, I think is our challenge. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. That was that was that was splendid. Um, another another very powerful um, presentation. I thought um, big issues. So thanks very much. Can we thank David for his? Um, <laughs> um, our next speaker is um, Joseph Professor Rose, Josephine.
Pemberson, um, who's a professor at the University of Edinburgh. Um, she's uh, going to be talking to us about soy. Can I just say on soy, I, I, um, I, I have a house in Steen, which is in Waternish, Waternish, and, and um, most mornings, on good mornings anyway, I watch a wee boat um, from the slip there going out to St Kilda, and I wonder how those people manage on that sea crossing. I was talking to uh, Josephine last night, and she said th there's three boats regularly go to St Kilda, and there's one of them where people get off in their green, and it's the boat from it's the boat from Steen because it's an awful long way across the across the Minch and then out out, out beyond. So anyway, Josephine's been out there uh, managing the soy sheep population for a long time. I'm not sure if you're still doing it, but certainly you've done it for a long time. I'm fascinated because I always thought soy sheep were from soy on the south of the sky, but you've told me that they're actually uh, originate in St Kilda. So, Josephine, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any sign of my slides? Yep, no. Uh, thank you very much to Des for the invitation slash um twist. <laughs> um, and I think I'm going to be, I think, and now for something completely different is really uh, going to be what this talk is about. Right, good. So um, I'm going to give you a talk about uh, a research project in ecology and evolution that we've been conducting for the last several decades. And I'm going to start with some audience participation. Can anyone tell me where these islands are, what these islands are? Anybody, anybody? No? OK, so these are the Galapagos Islands. And they have a very important role in the history of ecology and evolutionary studies. First of all, Charles Darwin went here in 1835 on the Beagle voyage. And uh, it was his observation of the divergence of what looked like an original one species into different types on different islands, combined with his observations in South America, that led him to the uh, theory of evolution by natural selection. Secondly, 140 years later, uh, there was a very famous study of this... Oh, can I have another? That's not moving on. Oh, oh, got too far. Right, very fa famous study of this quite dull-looking bird on one particular island. This is one of the finches known as Darwin's finches. And this couple here, Rosemary and Peter Grant, made an extraordinary study, which uh, is like a type specimen for my world. Basically, uh, they were studying the finches with marked animals, ringed animals, on a little island called Daphne Major, uninhabited little island, and in 76, 77, there was an El Nino event. So that's a, a major weather event in the Pacific. And there was a major drought on this island. So it went from the upper picture there, green, to the darker picture there, uh, definitely brown. And they studied what happened to the finches and their food supply in this interval. So first of all, the finches crashed. So they went from 1,400-odd birds to perhaps 400 Secondly, uh, looking into the food supply, they noticed that seed abundance dropped dramatically, so they were trying to set, census the seeds available to the finches. Thirdly, uh, yeah, the hardness of the seeds increased dramatically, so the remaining seeds that the birds had to eat were much, much bigger and harder. And as a result, over this crash, they noticed a increase in the body size and especially the beak size of the individuals that survived this event. So they actually observed natural selection in action in this population. And uh, this is a sort of inspirational study for a small number of studies that exist around the world into the details of how uh, evolution and ecological dynamics work. And islands have a particular role in all of this because um, there are some simplifying things that go on on remote islands. First of all, they have very simplified ecology. They tend to have fewer uh, what we call trophic levels uh, than in uh, major continental populations. 
uh, and there are fewer species to interact with generally. They have restricted immigration and emigration. These are totally natural processes, but they also make the study of ecology and evolution more complicated. And thirdly, uh, as we've just been hearing, islands are often subject to highly variable environmental conditions, which means that we have uh, ways of looking at dramatic effects, which might be more subtle in continental populations. Which brings us to St Kilda, uh, which um, I expect you all know where that is, um, and the Soe Sheep Project. And I'm going to do a very small potted history of Soe Sheep, uh, some of which is derived from the works of an archaeologist called Andrew Fleming, who is spending his retirement looking into the history of sheep on St Kilda, as far as I can tell. So before written records were begun, uh, exist, uh, ancestors of Soes were brought to St Kilda. We don't know when this was. They have the skeletal formation of Bronze Age domestic sheep, and they are quite closely related to the uh, mouflon, which are the progenitor of domestic sheep. Sometime over a long interval, and we don't know when, they were displaced from all but the island of Soe, which you see at the... Uh, oh, is that working? No, that battery's gone. Uh, oh, woo, didn't mean to do that. They got marooned on the island of Soe, and uh, that is where they have existed for hundreds of years, if not millennia. We just don't know. Soe is a pretty inaccessible place. I fell in the water when I tried to land on Soe. And uh, it's hard to believe that there was much management going on on Soe. More like, a, if the St Kildans used the sheep there at all, it was more like a harvesting operation. Uh, in 1930, uh, the domestic sheep were removed from Herta. Uh, as part of the human evacuation. And then a few years later, a bunch of Soe's were brought from Soe to Herta in what must have been a really epic exercise, I think. So we study the sheep living in Village Bay on Herta, which is that bit there. Now, the whole St Kilda group is owned by the National Trust for Scotland, and their policy, uh, long-standing uh, has been to not manage the sheep as they were probably not really managed on Soe. So we study them as wild animals, trying not to uh, intervene with natural processes more than uh, we feel strictly necessary. So uh, the one, two interventions we do make every year are to tag newborn lambs uh, so we can follow them for their entire lives. And uh, we also have a catch-up in August each year where we try to catch as many individuals as possible within the Village Bay area in order to weigh them and measure them and take various kinds of samples. More coming up. Uh, the other main thing that uh, I wanted to tell you about is uh, the genetic side of this project. So we're talking about islands present. We use very up-to-date genetic methods on this population. So there is a thing called the International Sheep Genomics Consortium. They create wonderful uh, technologies for using on sheep in their genetics. And uh, this object here, which is the size of a microscope slide, in each of these sort of channels here, you can test one sheep at 50,000 places in its genome to see what its genetics look like. And this gives us tremendous uh, power to look at evolution in action at the genetic level. And one of the main things to come out of this is that we have a very good pedigree for these sheep. So uh, this is uh, an example of a bunch of rams. And this guy here, New Red 49, also known as, snow, as Snowball for an anatomical feature. Uh, this is a... Um, a uh, picture of the pedigree, well, his descendants uh, across uh, the generations. So this is Snowball here. These are his two parents. He was born in 1989. He was pretty successful ram. So, and then several of his descendants have been pretty successful. So by the time you get to 2012 only, most of the lambs born in Village Bay have got little bits of Snowball genome in their uh, chromosomes. 
And by now, it'll have gone much further around the island, I should think. Uh, so by now, we have a huge amount of information on several thousand Zoe sheep in our database. And uh, we have done an awful lot of things with the data. I'm just going to show a couple of slides of the kind of scale of this operation. First of all, uh, a lot of people have been involved over the 40 years. There's a sort of list of uh, the scale of the operation there. And we generate data which is used by a huge number of students in various universities to do projects of one sort and another. And of course, uh, we have also published quite a lot from this um, project. And we've got uh, quite a big online presence and I just wanted to point out that nowadays we are increasingly sharing our data with other projects of a similar nature around the world to investigate how populations are responding to, for example, climate change. So there's a lot of co collaborative work going on between these long-term projects like ours. Okay, so clearly if we've written 240 research publications... Uh, we've covered a very wide range of subjects, and I've decided just to pick out three to talk to you about uh, today. So I'm going to talk about genetic variation. I'm going to talk about how they deal with their parasites. And I'm going to talk about how the population's responding to climate change. So, thinking about that first topic, um, people always ask me about, well, aren't they getting very inbred, and isn't inbreeding a problem? The Soe population on Herta, at least, is actually rather an interesting model for conservation geneticists who worry a lot about uh, the extent to which inbreeding might be preventing uh, success uh, and population increase. Uh, in fact, because uh, there's no management and there are many males trying to get paternity across the population the amount of inbreeding is much lower than you might expect. So less than half, percent, half a percent of the total population is what we would call closely inbred, as in the parents were close relatives. In this plot here, you've got a measure of how inbred individuals are along the bottom here. And these are the ages of sheep uh, getting older and older. And what you can see is that... Uh, through uh, winter mortality, principally, the inbred individuals are gradually weeded out of the population. So this is what we call inbreeding depression, and it certainly exists. But the interesting thing about it, which we have been demonstrating recently, is that as these animals uh, are lost from the population, they take with them the bad mutations, which are the underlying cause, cause of inbreeding depression. This is a process that uh, geneticists call purging, and it turns out to be quite an interesting and important process in the conservation of populations. So it actually is a way in which populations get rid of uh, the bad mutations that are continually accumulating in every population. Turning to a slightly lighter matter, um, one of the things we've been studying is about variation that we see uh, in the appearance of the animals. And one of the most striking ones is horn variation. So the guy on the left has got no horns. The guy on the right has got enormous horns. So how is this happening? How do we see both of these continuing on St Kilda? Um, well, we used our genetics to work out uh, basically the inheritance patterns of horns. And uh, here we go with uh, the three underlying kinds of genetics that you can have. Uh, guys have got two copies of a horns gene, horns, horns. They have big horns. Uh, guys that have one copy of horns and one copy of polled gene, they have slightly shorter horns. And then the guys who have two polled genes, they can have anything from that kind of a horn to a skur, which um, people will be familiar with, or, as I said earlier, no horn at all. So the question is, now that we know the underlying genetics, can we work out why this variation is being maintained? 
and my colleague Susan Johnson did a wonderful study uh, where she looked at uh, two components of fitness in a natural population. So this is reproductive success and survival. So over here, what she shows is that the polled, polled males have um, uh, much lower reproductive success than males with horns, which is entirely as you'd expect in a competitive mating system. On the other hand, what she shows here is that the uh, horned, horned males do not survive so well. They've got much lower survival over winter. In consequence of which, the most successful males overall are the ones that have the HP set up. So they're a horns polled uh, set up. And that, uh, which is also known as heterozygote advantage, is what is maintaining this variation in the population. They can't escape from the variation. So to summarise, uh, we have inbreeding, very rare between close relatives. Uh, inbred, inbred individuals die and take bad genes with them, a process called purging. Genetic variation at horns locus is maintained by selection on males, with HP males having the highest lifetime breeding success. And uh, we can't find anything going on in females, even though they also have variable horns. Uh, next up, we're talking about parasites. And the kind of parasites I'm talking about here are absolutely standard sheep parasites. Anyone who farms sheep will know about these. These are um, gastrointestinal worms. And uh, the life cycle is very straightforward. Uh, the sheep, the, the worms live in the sheep gut. Uh, they lay their eggs that come out in the droppings. They hatch out on the grass. And then they climb up the grass, ready to be eaten by the sheep. And... Um, in common with uh, most such research, the non-invasive way to study this is to uh, pick up droppings and count how many eggs of the worms are in the droppings. That's called a faecal egg count. Now, uh, in domestic sheep, uh, worming, worms are a major problem affecting performance of the sheep, and there's much use of antelmintic drugs to uh, reduce the burdens in the sheep. Antelmintic drugs are, are leading to the evolution of resistance in the worms. So there's a lot of interest in how you can uh, save the effectiveness of the antelmintics and or use the genetics of the sheep themselves to avoid having to use antelmintics. So we collaborate a lot with vets, uh, particularly from the Mordan Institute, who are interested in the question of what can the sheep do if they don't have any antelmintic treatment? What do we know about how they deal with it? And we've been doing a lot of parasitology and immunology to investigate this issue. I'm just going to show you a few slides on this. Uh, one of the most obvious things is that the sheep on Herta uh, get their parasites very young. So they're born in April, and uh, almost as soon as the worm life cycle allows, you start seeing eggs in the uh, faecal samples. And not much later, you see a big sex difference emerging. So males always have more parasites than females. <coughs> And uh, what we also see uh, as the year goes on, this uh, di divergence maintains, and uh, we know that individuals who are like the inbred ones on the extreme of the distribution of faecal egg count are the ones less likely to survive the winter. Uh, this pattern, so, so they have uh, a major fight with their parasites uh, in the first sort of second, the first year, towards the end of the first year. Um, thereafter, the faecal egg counts uh, drop quite a lot. So these are the lambs, and then uh, the faecal egg counts drop a lot. And we see that females go through a very classic, um, in their prime, they have very low parasites, and then as they get older, they senesce with respect to parasite burdens. Males consistently have much higher faecal egg counts. And 
This results, obviously, in there being quite strong selection to be resistant to the parasites. And one of my colleagues, quite a long time ago, conducted an experiment on mainland soas, comparing uh, the resistance with uh, blackface sheep. And here's her plot. So this is a little experiment where she uh, gave the sheep worm larvae here and then looked to see how the infections developed. And what she shows here is that the soas are uh, substantially more resistant to the worms than, for example, black faces. Now, what I've been talking about up till now is something called resistance, so antibody-associated reduction in parasite burden, and the ones that can do it best uh, are more likely to survive uh, and breed. But uh, parasitologists are also very interested in something called tolerance, and that is, uh, instead of uh, trying to resist how many worms you have, uh, uh, a question of to what extent can you maintain condition, in this case weight, despite having a parasite burden. I'm not sure if this is going to work, but here's my cartoon of how tolerance works. Uh, we weigh the animals at intervals uh, each year in August, <coughs> and we also look at their parasite burden. Now, a sheep that is very tolerant like this one here, would uh, maintain its weight despite a rising parasite burden. It could be anywhere on this plot, but it, it maintains its weight. So it could be anywhere on that line, but it maintains its weight. A very intolerant or least tolerant animal would lose weight a lot with a rising parasite burden. And um, vets are quite interested in this idea of tolerance because it's uh, potentially also got genetic underpinnings. And in the SOAs, what we've demonstrated is indeed that the very tolerant individuals in this category here are much more successful over time in terms of lifetime breeding success as compared with individuals in the least tolerant section. So, uh, as a summary, SOA sheep vary in resistance to parasites, and resistance is strongly favoured by natural selection. They are more resistant to parasites than the one commercial breed they've been tested against. And um, they also vary with respect to tolerance, and this too is strongly favoured by natural selection. How am I doing on time? Right, quick third topic. How is the population responding to climate change? Uh, so the annual herter sheep count shows that while the population goes up and down and up and down, it is rising, about 24 more sheep a year. Uh, according to the latest plot. Um, uh, David has already dealt with this in great detail, but as you all know, the weather is changing. Uh, these are the data for summer and winter, temperature, wind speed and rainfall uh, on St Kilda, um, but educated by the Stornoway Airport Met data. And everything is going up, OK? It's getting warmer, wetter and windier. Also, in conjunction with time, we see an increase in the productivity of the plants on St Kilda. So this is a little exclosure that has been set up at time one and then investigated in time two. It's got a sort of hay field inside it, which has not been grazed by the sheep because it's been protected. And we can measure the productivity uh, over time. And uh, colleague Mick Crawley did this for 25 years and uh, demonstrated that uh, several plant communities, including some of the most popular ones for sheep, were increasing in their productivity over time. Uh, not content with having that ground truthing, uh, another colleague called Robin Pakeman has been using satellite imagery to measure how green the different plant communities of St Kilda are over time. So there's something called... NDVI, which measures how green the vegetation is, and it's a proxy for how much vegetation there is. So, uh, from Robin's recent analysis, what seems to be happening goes something like this. Oh, no, that's right. First of all, he's, al he's also recorded an increase in uh, all vegetation types over time using the satellite imagery. So, 
here's what we think seems to be happening uh, to cause this rise in the Surrey population. Uh, first of all, we do know that the Surrey population in one year has an impact on the Surrey population in the next year. So this is called density dependence. And if the population is high in one year, tends to be lower in the next year and vice versa. We also know that winter weather here, at, exemplified by wind, has a negative effect on the size of the population the next year. But what we now also seem to have is summer temperature uh, increasing the plant productivity and that in turn increasing the soe population because when we fit plant productivity into models of soe sheep population change, it enhances, it improves the model. So uh, our current thinking is that the NDVI, the greenness of the most preferred vegetypes, provides the best explanation for the increase in sheep numbers over time. So what seems to be happening is the warming conditions are promoting plant growth, which is promoting sheep survival, and this is sufficient to overcome worsening aspects of winter weather. Uh, I know this is uh, islands present, but we have a future plan too, so there's all sorts of things we'd like to do in the future. Is the timing of annual events changing? Um, how much do early life events affect late life performance? So sort of studies in aging are much very prominent. Um, I want to look at the genes responsible for inbreeding depression. We have a project on gut health going on at the moment, and we're very interested in whether social interactions play a role in the population dynamics. So with those acknowledgements there, I shall shut up and take questions if there are any. Well, thank you very much, Josephine. Um, fascinating. Um, <laughs> um, do you know what I'd like to ask you? It sounds cheeky, but <laughs> can I do it anyway? So what's the significance of this? What's the what, um, 240 papers on, on soy sheep. So what, 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 how can we extrapolate from this? Um, or can we extrapolate for other populations and so on? Where does it, where does it all go? So yeah, the answer is that I think there are many cases where the sort of data we collect is extrapolated. Mm. Often in these combined projects, I mean, one would like replication much more than one has for these sort of projects. And this combination of projects from other long-term studies of individuals is very much getting us towards really understanding how individuals and populations will respond to climate change, as an example, but also to introduction of invasives and that sort of thing. Yeah. 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 Okay, has anyone else got uh, yes at the back? Um, I, I first visited St Kilda in 1973 and I've had the great good fortune to re revisit the islands a dozen times since then. On one of these occasions, your colleagues involved in the SOE research were gathering data and I had a conversation with one of them and was asking <clears throat> what the research was about, and they explained that they, their explanation was that it was long-term research into natural selection. I then asked your question, Chris, you know, what had been learned from it? And what they said was, their reply was that the, uh, they had established that one of the best predictors of survivability was bone density. Now, I have no idea, is this the case or not, but it's my first opportunity to ask an expert, is this the case, and have you actually discovered, or have you discovered anything else that is a predictor of survivability or, uh, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I have never heard us, of us studying bone density and my colleague in the audience is also making faces at me, saying he doesn't remember that either. Um, the, there are, we have many predictors of survivability. Um, the main one is how much do you weigh in the summer? Um, and uh, the second one would be uh, how many parasites have you got? And the, another major one would be what sex are you? 
because I'm afraid that males uh, die more than females in their first winter. Thank you. <laughs> My, the person I questioned was obviously making it up. Right. How unlike an academic. <laughs> oh. Okay, I think I think we'll we'll, we'll bring this okay. session to to an end. Thanks very much for that. That was that, no, no, that, 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 that's great. And um, can I? Well, we've been to Kil St Kilda and back. I'll need to finish the story I began earlier on when people end up being green when they land in St Kilda. Well, they can come back to Steen at night. They're white <laughs> <laughs> because they've lost the will to, and they've lost the will to. Well, they're very delighted to be back anyway, but on the sea journey, they haven't been happy. OK, let's move on to the next one now, which is um, Professor Con Crocker O'Gilligan. Um, he's going to be talking about present, not, uh, not counted, addressing the societal condition of the Gaelic vernacular community in the islands. He's the um, research, Gaelic research professor at the UHI and also director of the UHA UHI Language uh, Research Centre, is it? Yes, in Vid. So, welcome. Stalker will share show Fesker in his house, a Feskerma, Gartena, Agasami, and the Brook Tolache, if we call the Ruven Jew, and some of the Vigal Pars suggests with Hudderbuch Show. I was Mohang on RSC, er son Kurdish Horse Hall. Brin Ruv, I guess, be a Galparst, Sakhal Avast. I'm going to talk a little about our publication, the 2020 publication, The Gaelic Crisis in the uh, Vernacular Community. You'll all be delighted to know I won't be going into too much data. I really want to talk about the public debate that has surrounded the book and how we move on from where we are at the minute. Uh, now, am I working this right? There we go. I'll make four po uh, uh, Sorry, I've gone too far. I want to address four issues. Uh, I'll say a little about the research evidence. Then I want to talk about the effects of the academic and official responses to the study. Then I'll talk a little about the legislative re reform that has been uh, suggested following the public debates on these issues. And then at the end, I look to uh, new po possibilities, given the situation we're in at the minute. Um, my, hang on, I'm not using this correctly. There I have it now. Before I start, um, we'll ask, what is the problem we're trying to uh, address here? And I think what we have is the civic promotion of Scottish Gaelic without, without, without the societal protection of the vernacular community. We have promotion, but insufficient protection. And this syndrome is leading to what I refer to as the monolingualization of the bilingual Gaelic group, despite the official support for Gaelic affairs. The Gaelic crisis study in the vernacular community, I'm going to refer to it now, you'll see it in the slides as GCVC. Uh, and the main point of that, with, within the remaining social geography of the native speaking vernacular group, the social use and the transmission of Gaelic is now at the point of societal collapse. So the issue is, what are we going to do about this? If I can just very quickly go through some of the core evidence. At a demo linguistic level, the vernacular group now numbers around 11,000 people according to our analysis the majority of whom are over 50, and the youth cohort among the vernacular group is now less than uh, 2,000 speakers. The home transmission of Scottish Gaelic is now a vestigial aspect of community life, and we see this in our preschool survey, where less than 5% of the preschoolers had, uh, home had experience of the home practice of Gaelic. So that's an indication of familial transition. There's also strong evidence in the teenager survey that the, there's very weak youth socialization of Gaelic, even though 20% of the teenage cohort has a fluency in Gaelic, only 2% of the teenagers use it in social practice among themselves. So that's the effective or the productive uh, transmission rate. 
taken this evidence as a whole, and you compare it then to the policy, the assertions in the policy, we, it's quite clear, and we make this point uh, clearly in the book, that policy is not addressing the societal reality of the end game demise of the native speaking group uh, in the islands. There'll be a, a few visuals just to reinforce the point. You can see there a comparison of the 50 plus cohort and the level of decline over a 30 year period taken from census analysis and the, in comparison then to the youth cohort between 3 and 17, the pre precipitous drop from 1981 to 2011 and we're awaiting the new census results to see, see what the situation is currently. This visual also indicates these are our survey areas. There, there are 25 survey areas in the Western Isles, north of Skye and Taree. And this shows the average has dropped from 80% in 1981 uh, to a little over 50% in the 2011 census across all the remaining vernacular areas. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm not going to uh, editorialize our talk on these. I'm going to give you a quick visual. This, these are the census results. On the left of the screen there, that's the Gaelic ability result in the, in the results in the census from 1981 onwards. And then on the right, that's the youth cohort. The dark black, they are the areas with 90% plus uh, reported levels of Gaelic ability, and the weak are the light greys, they're below 45% in according to the census. And we'll just go through it. 1991, 2001, 2011. So essentially what's happened in the community, we've gone from high density, the black, now to the low density, below 45%. Uh, that's indicating the crisis, that's a visual of the crisis we're dealing with. Uh, what then is the prognosis for Scottish Gaelic in this context where we have civic promotion without vernacular protection? So promotion, no protection is the argument. And I'm going to use a diagnosis that uh, Louis-Jean Calvé, uh, a sociolinguist, he talked about language being in competition with other languages, so an eco ecosystem of languages. Scottish Gaelic is soon to be a marginal, peripheral, non-vernacular secondary language that is subject to majoritarian sanction. So as long as there is majority tolerance for Gaelic, it will survive as a second language. What is the mode of acquisition? How, they, how do the speakers acquire their ability? Well, with the first language possibilities eroded because of societal pressures, all that's left is what we refer to in linguistics as programmed acquisition. In other words, a complete reliance on the schooling system. And then what is the direction uh, of acquisition when the first language context has been eroded? And this is vertical, downward, optional acquisition of a low status language by speakers of a high status language. And the difficulty here for the use of a language in society is that it creates low normativity low normative capacity in society for the language, and it, that leads to limited social function. That the language can survive in school in, in this circumstance, but it cannot survive in communities or society. Okay, what are the effects then of the official and academic response to this evidence that we published in this uh, 2020? First of all, uh, Alistair, an MSP for the Western Isles, uh, he was charged with conducting community consultations in the, in the different areas, and this was published as a state document in late 2020 and presented at a Gaelic ministerial summit that was chaired by John Swinney, the minister, the uh, cabinet secretary for education at the time. Also, uh, shortly after that, 
There was discretionary funding. I believe what I'm hearing is it an underspend in the Gaelic Affairs budget in the government, and they established, as I referred to it there, a non-core budget of 354,000, and they set they use this money to hire uh, a team of Gaelic development officers, mainly located uh, in the vernacular areas, and. You'll have seen the recent controversy. Uh, my colleague in the Language Sciences Institute, Ian Kimble, uh, he says that this has been discontinued for ideological reasons, simply because the sum of money is so small, the argument for discontinuing it must be political uh, rather than financial. Some of you might be surprised to know that there has been no formal contact from Gaelic bodies with the authors of the Gaelic crisis until the summer of 2023. Uh, and uh, my colleague again, Ian Kimble, he put this very eloquently in a recent article in the Stornoway Gazette. And uh, since he said it so well, I might as well just read it out. A, a nothing to see here approach was initially adopted by Borsh na Gaelic, aided and abetted by those in positions of authority and influence informing and directing Gaelic development policies. So basically, the initial reaction was to treat the evidence as a non-issue. So obviously, because there was so much consultation, there was a very lively public debate. The book had impact, but there has been no serious official engagement with either the documented evidence or the recommendations that we had to mitigate the level of crisis in the community. The upshot of the consultation is that the community has been consulted back to the status quo without really addressing the issues. We see a combination of official control freakery and evasiveness that has descended into a containment exercise rather than a constructive engagement with the issues. Um, I th again, I have no evidence for this, I'm only surmising. Uh, I think because the official consultation, consultative process went nowhere, then the MSP uh, for the Highlands, uh, Kate Forbes, she commissioned a uh, short-life short working group to look at these issues from an economic and a social policy point of view, and to give them their due, they acknowledge the demographic, economic, and demolinguistic issues and trends involved, as we had indicated previously in the Gaelic crisis study. Uh, but this consultation and this report was conducted completely independently of the Gaelic crisis authors. In this publication, there is no reference to the implications of the overall conclusions or the strategic recommendations entailed in the book. I would also, this is the analysis of the team in the Language Sciences Institute, that this publication fails to suggest a feasible language policy and language planning approach to the societal crisis of the speakers. So essentially, it's more consultation without addressing the issue. Um, now, there has been a, an academic follow-up. Uh, myself and Ian Campbell felt we had more to say about the policy framework, and we published uh, in the Journal of Scottish Affairs, and then that elicited a response. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail. I'm just indicate if you want to look into it yourselves. This, these publications are only for consenting adults, so I'm not going to try you, try your patience now by going into them. However, you will allow me to give a synopsis of what I uh, refer to as the hostile academic responses. Most of the reviews of the book were very positive. The hostile ones came from academics uh, based in Scotland. The in a way, it's difficult to take the criticisms seriously because the criticisms, criticisms are mostly rhetorical in nature. Uh, there is, this is quite common in, when there's hostility in academic affairs. They've questioned, it's a very superficial questioning of the methodology that we applied, 
even though the methodology is multivariate. There, there are five surveys in it. Uh, however, I don't take it seriously because there is no serious engagement with the findings. You have to address the data if you want to take part in the debate. The, even though they uh, question the methodology, they dismiss the findings as being of little surprise to them. However, th these are academics who had been in the, field, in the field for 20 years, and they have produced no comparable documented evidence to indicate why this is of no surprise. The role of academia is to establish it by evidence. How have they established their lack of surprise with evidence? Likewise, they have disregarded the strategic model in favour of more of the existing approach. So the existing approach isn't working clearly, and they're asking for more of the same. Well, that's a recipe for madness, basically. Uh, they also use this argument that uh, if we're highlighting troubling findings, this will be discouraging to learner activism, and it's inimical, uh, inimical sorry, to the political lobbying for more resources. Uh, I would categorize this as protecting the public from reality syndrome. I think it's never a good look in academia to treat the public as if they're stupid. This, the public know quite well um, what's going on. A related trope, the, again a rhetorical trope, uh, they accuse us of in, because we're talking, they're indicating the bad news, the policy isn't working, this is hastening uh, the demise of the community. Um, you'd be surprised that uh, if I tell you I'm old enough to uh, remember 30 years of this research from South Kerry up to the north of Lewis for over 30, 30 years, as I'm saying, I have never heard a person in the community criticizing us for telling us about the reality of the situation. The people who have been critical are salary holders that receive their salary because of the policy dispensation. The people want to hear the truth about the situation. Taking the hostile criticisms as a whole, basically what they're indicating is that the Gaelic crisis is taken as an affront to this well-established nexus, until our book came along of course, this nexus of sociolinguistic discourse, the official management of Gaelic language policy and planning, the sponsored uh, public policy Gaelic development, uh, and aspects of language activism and language uh, politics. In other words, the relationship bet between all these dimensions was way too cosy, and that stopped them from addressing reality. Okay then, what are the implications then of this official plus academic uh, evasiveness. And we see it's quite clear in their failure to address the reality of the vernacular situation, we now see now why Gaelic affairs is in an incoherent relationship, as I'm putting here, with the reality of the speaker community. If they're rejecting reality, what is left of them is only an imagined utopian future without a first language community uh, of speakers. So it's fantasy rather than social policy is what they're relying on. Uh, what this does in effect is that it decouples the advantages and influence of the power class for having responsibility for the collective, which is now in uh, demise. What we're actually seeing now is that we have a sanctioned, denialist framework for Gaelic affairs that's reliant on a banal postmodernist, in other words, individualist, individualized, deconstruction of language shift, language shift from a Gaelic speaking community at the minute to an English speaking community in the social geography of the Gael. This depends on what I refer to as numberism. This is a naive numbers game by which they think, it's investing in false hopes again, that the 
contraction of the native speaking community can be compensated for by increasing the numbers of learners. This obviously implies a third concept, and I didn't invent it, this is by a colleague, Gordon Cameron, in the Language Sciences Institute in the UHI. He refers to this syndrome as abandonism. And that's, this means that obviously the implication for the power class is that they're assessing the level, that the language shift to English is so advanced that nothing else can be done. And what they're essentially saying is, even though it's not declared publicly, what they are saying is that the Gaelic community is to be abandoned to their fate, while at the same time allowing for these assertions and ex exertions by the activist uh, cohort. What does this all say about the quality of democracy that surrounds Gaelic affairs uh, in Scotland? Well, you've seen in our analysis that there has been a lack of open and honest debate that has circled around this insincere focus on um, so the societal reality of the speakers. So, plenty of piety, no serious engagement. There has been an ongoing prioritization of sectoral concerns over the social challenges of the minority group. This sectoralism, as I've referred to it before, we, we addressed this issue in the 2021 publication of Scottish Affairs. The, this sectoralism leads to a situation where we have an inflated level of influence among, among certain sectoral leaders, and these sectoral leaders are drawn from key personalities in arts and media management, academia, the education sector, civic and public policy bodies, and the language promotion uh, agencies. I think that this sectoral leadership, in other words, those who have power, uh, this sectoral approach, it's engendered what I refer to as a referent class. A referent class, it's a concept from sociology, those who are referred to when decisions are being made. And it's a referent class of power brokers, and I think this power class numbers less than 20 people uh, in Scotland. Uh, and 20 people having power over a complete uh, ethno-linguistic group, I think is very undemocratic. And that has lead, led us to the, the conclusion again in the Language Sciences Institute that we think Gaelic affairs now is controlled by non-democratic democratic processes. The lack of democracy also, I, help, I think that this helps explain the inertia uh, that has arisen from the reluctance of the power brokers to adapt to so social reality. Okay, if we just stop there for a second and think about this avoidance of reality. Obviously, there are winners and losers in this. And on the left of the screen, the winners are obviously those that are acquiescent with the ongoing trend. And we just look at them, who are they? The indifferent majority language speakers, obviously if they're not concerned, complacent politicians, complacent corporate and sectoral leaders, the elite class in the language planning bodies, those involved in a societal minority language scholarships in scholarship. In other words, those engaging in the study of Gaelic and minority languages that don't really care about the societal situation. Equally, those involved in new speakerist ideologies and also those who want to consume the Gaelic, Gaelic culture but are not really interested in the uh, nitty gritty of its uh, social circumstances. And also the current uh, language users that can benefit from having uh, native speaker, speaking, speaking teachers and professors and broadcasters. Uh, that's only successful for now. If we look on the right-hand side of the, um, the slide, the losers, who are they in the present dispensation? They're the current native speakers of Gaelic, 
the learners of Gaelic who have benefited from the native speaking collective, the learners of Gaelic who have an interest in the collective heritage of the native speaking group, and also the learners with an interest in the socio-cultural capital of that group. And I think also that the aesthetic practitioners and the creatives, basically, who have a societal focus, they are going to learn out. But ultimately, the future learners of Gaelic are going to be losers as well, because they have no community of native speakers to whom they can refer in their acquisition process. OK, we'll move on now to the reform, the suggested reform as in the Scottish Languages Bill. And the, the big question here, here is, how, diff okay. how different is it from the status quo? The time is running out, so I'm just going to go, go, go through this very, very quickly. Uh, the basic question we have to ask, they're asserting this as an amendment of the 2005 Act, but is it really reform? Is it a re bureaucratization of more of the same. And I just I won't, won't have time to go through it all there. Uh, we, I raise a series of questions. I, I hope to publish this so you can, we can go through it again. Uh, I'll just go on to the, sorry. Why is, there we, sorry. Okay, this, the main change is this issue of areas of linguistic significance. And we really have to ask, is this actually a promotion or a demotion of those involved in the vernacular uh, community? What we see now is that the vernacular areas are in competition with two other designations. So uh, how, if there's two other de designations, how are they going to get their needs uh, prioritized when the situation is critical at the minute? OK, I'll go on to the possibilities for a new approach. Um, we know now from the evidence that the status quo and the uh, continuation of the Gaelic native speaking group are now incompatible. What do we need then? Uh, we need an acknowledgement of the critical situation so that support so that agencies can intervene in support of the vernacular group. In other words, we're acknowledging publicly and politically that there is a crisis. Policy has to be developed that is relevant to the crisis. And the only way to do that is to build leadership and capacity in the community themselves to address the issue. And that implies, obviously, a prioritization in the Gaelic policy framework to allow them to do this. Uh, because the situation now is so critical and at the point of collapse, we're talking really about renewal and revival, even in the vernacular area. And this requires an approach uh, that is rooted in community development, and there was talk of this yesterday. This obviously needs socioeconomic initiatives. It will also require, uh, in our estimation, a new educational framework that is rooted in the group cultural capital. What we have at the minute is a translated curriculum from the English language curriculum in Irish rather than a rooted cultural uh, curriculum. We're missing also there is a lack of comprehensiveness and complementarity between the native speaking uh, constituency, our uh, contexts, and that of the learners. Sorry. If I can just finish on the I've gone ahead of it, so if I can get back to it. Oh. OK, I'll just, I'll just make the point then. It's, has it come back? No. Oh. oh, there we are. Sorry, we've got it back. This is the final slide. I think it's critical, though. I started on this point of we have language promotion, but we do not have language protection. How do we start thinking about integrating these two things so that the promotion and the protection help each other? On the left of the screen, that is, that's basically summarizes what we're doing at the minute. Civic promotion, the public visibility of Gaelic, the profile of Gaelic in public bodies, 
There's corpus planning, media innovations, educational innovations, and the, the official body support a level of ad advocacy for the group. On the right then of the screen, this is what we're, not, there's elements of it, but we're not doing it in any systematic way or any way that is informed by evidence or informed by a sociological process. Um, and I think to integrate these two, protection with promotion, that I've set out here the dimensions of what I think would be a productive debate. In other words, we've had evasiveness up to now, it's time for a productive de debate. Who will take corporate responsibility for the strategic in uh, integration of these issues? The Scottish Government, Borsch na Gaelic, or other public bodies? How do we strengthen the hand of the community? Can we think about direct funding models now uh, for Gaelic affairs via community trusts or other local co-ops or other uh, public bodies we have in the islands? This issue of the non-democratic processes, how do we enhance local democracy and the participation of the Gael so that we have politics for and of the minority rather than this majoritarian politics that we have at the minute. In other words, Gaelic affairs is dominated by remote control, basically. There, if we do this, there are better possibilities for cooperation across sociolinguistic contexts and across the social geography of Gaelic affairs. I'm going to finish on uh, this point that um, I think we need to relax a little. We have to get beyond this hostility in the public debate. Um, hostility gets us nowhere. All that it has done, it has tried to shoot the messenger. Shooting the messenger is not going to make the reality and the challenges disappear. Because alternatives have not, been, have not been considered, everything is still to play for. So let's have an honest and open debate and get to a more mature way of dealing with these issues rather than infantile hostility. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We, we, um, we don't have a lot of time for questions. Is there a super talk, um, another passionate, powerful talk? You know, that's, that's, that's what we've had all morning, actually. Uh, is there a burning question? I'll tell you, there, there, is, there will be the opportunity, I mean, there's a lot in that stuff, um, a lot of stuff in that, sorry. These talks will be available on the RSE website, so you can actually later on, you know, come back to them and, and, and look in more detail at, at, at the data there. That's, that's the case for all the talks. Um, is there, though, a burning question anyone has to ask before we move on to our final speaker? Um, I'm sure there are, actually, but people are being polite because it, well, time's running yes, out. But anyway, sure. thanks very much Thank for that. Very that was great. Thank you. Um, OK, so our final speaker um, is, is Roxanne Anderson, who is a research... Uh, Professor Anderson is a senior research fellow at the Environmental Research Institute, part of the UHI, and I think is based in Thurso, which is a um, place I've never been, much to my shame. But um, where, where is Rox oh, Roxanne? Is, Roxanne is behind me. Right, OK. Uh, hi there. I'm sorry I didn't realise you were going to be online, but it's great to see you. Um, you're going to be talking about... Um, sorry, my bits of paper are shuffled around here. You're going to be talking about, dear me, bog breathing from space, how mechanics help redefining our understanding of peatland resilience. Okay. So, that's correct. Thank that's, you, Red. Welcome that's correct. from Thurso and, um, or welcome from Stornoway to you in Thurso. So, carry on, Roxanne. Thank you very much. Just checking as well that everybody can see my screen because I can only see um, myself at the moment. Um, so thank you very much. And just, just to say a, a very big thank you for allowing me to join online. Um, the reason I could not make it here in person today is that I was hosting a conference myself over the last week. 
and the logistics just didn't work out for me to travel all the way to Stornoway. However, I'm delighted to have been invited to share some of the research that we've been bu building over the last seven years in, in, um, in conjunction with the University of Nottingham, uh, the University of the Highlands and Islands, with uh, quite a lot of funding coming from a wide variety of sources, including UKRI, Lever Hume Trust, People in Action and Scottish Forestry. Um, so the talk that I want to do today is really to take you through a bit of a journey around how the work that we have done has really enabled us to get a new understanding of peatland resilience and what it means. Um, just to get started, peat forms, it, it is a type of soil in the landscape that forms where there is more accumulation of organic matter by plants than decomposition by microbes. This is basically where carbon from the atmosphere is taken by plants through photosynthesis, deposited into the plant as biomass, builds up and builds up over time, but is not fully decomposed because peatlands tend to be cold places, wet places, and places where there is not very much activity from the microbes. As a result of that, it builds up over time. However, it builds up very slowly and in northern peatlands, it's estimated that peat builds up at a rate of about one millimeter per year or 0.6 millimeter per year in the north of Scotland, where it's a little bit colder. And if you imagine peat deposits being sometimes up to eight or nine meters, it really means that they have been in this landscape since the last time that the glacier retreated over 10,000 years ago and have just been simply building up this organic matter over time. Therefore, peat landscapes are very important for the storage and the sequestration of carbon over very, very long timescales. In fact, over the world, peatland as, a, as an ecosystem only cover about 3% of the land mass. So it's a very small proportion of the land surface area that they cover, yet they store about a third of all of the soil organic carbon. They are disproportionately important in their role in terms of the sequestration and storage of carbon over very, very long timescales. And it's, it's estimated, therefore, that peatland, despite covering a very, very small area, store more carbon than all of the Earth's forest biomass combined. And, and, and that sometimes puts a bit more of an image. If you take all of the trees of all of the planet and you put them together, there is still less carbon in that than if you take the peatland. Yet we don't very often hear about people in, in, in that way, or at least it's changing a little bit, but they are disproportionately important in that, in that role. And through that role of taking the carbon out of the atmosphere and putting it into long-term storage, peatland play a fundamental role in, in the, the regulation of the Earth's climate and, and in the mitigation of potential climate change. The way in which peatland function is, is, is really intricate and complicated, but in reality, it's a series of feedback loop. That means that some specialist plant, for example, sphagnum, like on the slide, sphagnum mosses, but other types of plant, um, help maintain a very high water table. By maintaining the high water table, a very wet environment, they maintain the condition uh, during which carbon can be stored. And, and this has been known in this relationship between the plants basically creating their own habitat and then the water table being maintained very high and maintaining the peat formation, which in itself maintained the plant. It becomes this feedback mechanism that is really, really important. And this habitat is also a habitat where only specialist species can, can, can thrive because of these conditions of acidity that is brought up by the sphagnum plants, of wetness and, and of anaerobic condition. As a result, as well as being disproportionately important for carbon, peatland are also very important for biodiversity because they don't have a very large number of species, but the species that they have tend to be unique and very highly specialized. However, and for this talk, we need to reimagine peatland, not just as ecological and hydrological landscape, but also landscapes where there is a media, a poroelastic media. If you have ever walked on a peatland, you know that it's soft, squishy, and that it compresses and it compacts when you step on it or sometimes when you fall through it. And this poroelasticity, the fact that it has a mechanical response 
to the changes in volumes of gas and water in the, in the matrix of the peat. I've been known for a very, very long time. And they interplay with the ecology and the hydrology of the peatland in a way that maintains resilience. It is the three parts of a system that work together really in, in a really, really close and complex way through a series of feedback. This phenomenon, the phenomenon of the bog expanding when the water increases and shrinking when the water decreases, has been known and described for a long time as bog breathing, because it is the surface that moves, the mechanical expression of these changes is from the surface. But bog breathing, although it's been known for a very long time, since the, the, the late 70s, it's been extremely difficult to measure underground, because as you can imagine, trying to measure a mechanical response if you walk on a peatland, you're influencing this mechanical response, and so it becomes impossible to measure without having an influence over it. However, this all changed in 2016, when a new satellite uh, the, through the, uh, the European Space Agency um, put a new satellite online. And in the satellite goes over the Earth every 12 days, and when there's two satellites, they go over the Earth every six days. So every six days, every area of the planet gets an image taken. This particular satellite was a bit uh, different and, and very interesting for us because it uses synthetic aperture radar. Radar passes through cloud. That's important in Scotland because we have a lot of cloud cover. So having something that can go through cloud and bounces back provides an image effectively every time that the satellite goes around the planet. And what the satellite synthetic aperture radar does is that it bounces off the surface and goes back to the satellite, therefore giving a precise or giving a position of the surface. And if you stack multiple images every time the satellite goes, you effectively build up time series of these surface displacement. And by building this time series of surface displacement over very, very large areas, we can build up these, these long time series of effectively the bog breathing signal itself. And over the last seven years, this is what the team with the University of Nottingham and, and, and my team have been developing, is how do we then use these time series of bog breathing to change our understanding of peatland? There's lots of ways that we can do that. We can extract the properties of these time series, look at how do they go up? Do they go down over very long periods of time? How is the amplitude of all the motion? Um, how much time does it take to fill up? How much time does it take to, to, to go back down? And by looking at all of these things, we can then go in the field and do some validation and then get insights and application. Today, I will not go through all the details of how we get to, to validation and application, and I will only focus on the validation, some of the validation and the insights and application that we get from that. But what is important to understand is that this was the first tool that really allowed us to delve into the mechanics of peat without influencing the, the, the peat surface itself. And one of the ways that we can really understand why mechanics in peatland is important is by looking at a dramatic event where the mechanical failure has led to a mass loss of peat. So if you like, we, we have these events that happen uh, every so often, but they are the, the, the most extreme mechanical expression of what happens when a peatland moves a little bit too much. And it's predicted with climate change that more of these landslide or peat slides are likely to happen if they're associated because they're associated with, with uh, strong, very severe storms. And, and what we, we thought is, well, this is an example of an extreme bog breathing. So we should be able to detect it using bog breathing. And the way we went about it is we looked at the time series and we decided to focus on the extreme responses to rainfall events where we had outliers, mo movements that seem way bigger than what they should have been compared to the background movement. And what we found was astonishing. We found that wherever we were able to locate this extreme motion, it tended to coincide with real uh, areas where bogs had burst or where areas where they were likely to burst in the future, so areas of high risk. What you can see in the slide here is this is the mean bog peat slide that happened in 2020. 
And this is here outlined in, in black, the same area from our satellite pixel. And the yellow pixel indicate areas of extreme motion. These are the really big outliers. And as you can see, the area of big outliers correspond exactly to the area where the failure initiated. And you can see other in other places of the landscape, there are these other ones, and they tend to correspond to areas where the water is likely to accumulate in the landscape, the, in the landscape. So on the drainage on the other side of the forestry, where the forestry may be acting as a barrier. And therefore, the amount of water going in, making the peat swell way too much, has basically created the failure in this case. And we've now developed a method to improve the detection of areas that are at risk of failure. It doesn't mean that they will fail, but it means that if we do restoration or wind farm construction, these areas should get more attention and be monitored a bit more closely. But climate change is other predictions too. For example, prediction, the, the prediction suggests that the droughts, like the ones that we've experienced in 2018, 2010, 21, and 2023, are likely to become more frequent, but also more severe. And this is what happens when you have a severe drought on a peatlands. You get sometimes cracking and, and complete dewatering. In SAR, again, the, the, the mechanical response to that dewatering can really give us an insight into how the landscape as a whole responds to droughts. So in 2018, we had a project going where we were trying to validate the INSAR measurements from the satellite and understand, does the satellite measure something that we can also measure on the ground, something real? And, and can we capture this? So we set up a number of sites. So two sites here in Knockfin Heights and Lonsery, both are in the Flow Country peatlands of Cape Mess and Sutherland. And what we did is we, we used the, the, the best possible equipment at the time for the high precision leveling. And we basically did a, a very difficult exercise of leveling, measuring very precisely the movement of the surface. And that covered the periods of the drought. And what we found was that effectively the surface during a drought collapsed and it collapsed differently in different parts of the system. Imagine a pool system with lots of mosses. It is very soft, spongy, squishy, and it dewaters. What happens when it dewaters? And these are the blue and gray line here. It just sinks up to 10 centimeters in the space of a few days and it collapses to track the water table. And that's just a physical response. The pores break down and go into, and then it, it as it collapses, it gets wetter. This response is much more muted in the margins of the peatland where it's shrubbier and the peat is stiffer. And what we found is that effectively, this is a, a, a response that allows the peatland to maintain and become wetter after a drought, which is extremely counterintuitive. And what we found was that both our measurements here in, in the two measurements, the, the measurements by our survey technique and the INSAR measurements were effectively tracking each other very well. In other words, we were able to, to, to say that the accuracy of their measurements was sufficient to allow us to continue our research and, and expand this to full landscape rather than only a few pixels at the time. But as well as drought, the climate prediction are also for an, an increased number of days where fire weather might be uh, more severe. And with droughts and fire weather combined, and the fact that most of the fires in the UK are caused by human, by often by accident, we are likely to see more of these catastrophic wildfires happening in the future. And again, INSAR gives us another means to understand how peatland as a landscape can respond to the succession of droughts and fire. And this is what happened in 2019. We had a very severe fire in the flow country that covered in excess of 6,500 6, hectares. And that fire, the footprint of which is presented here, um, happened immediately after the 2018 drought. And this is the, 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 the kind of land uses that we have in this footprint of the fire in blue here. You can see that the footprint included lots of areas with existing drains, drainage, so areas where the peatland may be degraded, areas where the drains have been blocked, and areas of natural pool systems. 
And as we've just heard, the amplitude of the, the capacity of the peatland to move up and down in responses to the changes in water is, is a really important feature of that bump breathing that provides some resilience to the system. And so here I'm presenting you in the next few slides, a series of those, this is the fire footprint. And in the color, you can see the purple, the color, the darker purple color indicate areas that have very little amplitude. And the more you get into those yellow colors, these are the areas that are the most dynamic. We have a year where there's recharge, lots of water, recharge, again, lots of water, the drought, a fire, another year of recharge, and then another drought getting into 2022. And what we can see, and I've indicated them, these are all the areas where we have drains. These areas are stiff because of the drainage as is, is, is basically led to this collapse of the of the, the peat already. It's much stiffer. And what you can see is that they don't really respond to the changes in the weather or in the climate of every year. So they, they just stay purple. They're just purple. They don't move very much regardless of what is happening with the weather. If you turn to the other areas, those areas that are restored or that have pool system, if you look at them over the time series, what you can see is that in a recharge year, they don't have a lot of amplitude, but then suddenly they get these bright yellow spots appearing. And these appear in periods of drought, effectively demonstrating to, to, to us that the peatlands are able to cope with these multiple drought periods by just collapsing, tracking the water, as long as there is a recharge period in between, they will be able to respond to this. And the recharge here, again, bright yellow, this means that the surface has risen because it's rewatered. It's basically taken up the water and then collapsed again. And this is a, a, a really good way of looking at a landscape scale response and understanding how different parts of the landscape work together. It also gives us a, a new way of understanding how peatland might respond and, and might be resilient and how resilience might, might appear. So on the left-hand side, we have what we would consider a good peatland in good condition. It's low, it's dense, it, it's not a very dense peatland, it's soft. When it's dry, it shrinks, it can then get, it, it gets a bit wetter um, because it is shrunk. And then if there's a the fire, it tends to be low severity fire, which helps the recovery to another soft peat. So you get this negative feedback loop. However, through climate change or degradation, you might get into a situation where the peat is stiff. And instead of going down with the water table, it cracks, which leads to a low moisture, a higher severity and, and intensity of fire, which tends to wipe out the mosses and brings more shrubs, which tends to make the peat stiffer. And so you have this positive feedback loop that maintains this degradation stage. And what is interesting or important to understand is, can we change this net positive feedback loop back into a negative feedback loop for restoration and strategic management? In Scotland, we have a very large proportion of our peatland have been degraded. Up to 80% of our peatlands have had some sort of human influence, whether it's drainage, grazing, um, uh, mere burn, um, peat cutting, or afforestation. And there is an ambition to restore up to 250,000 hectares of those peatlands. There is also renewable energy putting wind farms sometimes on peatland that have a mandate to restore those peatlands underneath the, the wind farm in infrastructure. How can we prioritize these areas that need to be restored? How can we make decisions and how can we monitor these areas to ensure that the restoration is deployed effectively? How can we do that at scale? It's not possible to send people underground to do this over and over again. We need a better way of doing it. And we think INSAR provides part of the solution. And this is where we have to go back to our conceptual. So I've already talked to you about good Good peatland has high amplitude cycles, it swells and it shrinks following the water cycle. Stiff peatland can be very degraded, but it could also be the margins of the peatland where naturally shrubs will be more dominant. It's stiff, it has low amplitude and doesn't swell very much. And I'm introducing here degrading peatland, which would have as well as a redu reduction in amplitude over time would have a negative trend. So they will be losing mass over time, a sign of erosion or oxidation. And what we do is we use a very clever way to look at our data. Imagine 
a fox. And I'm asking you, you can't, you, you don't know that it's a fox, but I want you to tell me what do you think it is most like? Is it most like a dog? Is it most like a mouse? Or is it more like a cat? And we can use a probability of each of these. So we could say, well, it's got most of the features of a dog, but it's not quite a dog. It's definitely not very close to a fox. And it has maybe pointy ears like a cat, but not very much of the other features. So although I can't say that it's a fox, I can say that it's much more likely to be a dog. And we do the same with our pixels. We look at the time series that comes out. It's never a pure signal of a good, stiff, or eroding or degrading peatland. It's a bit of a mixture of all of this, but we can give by looking at the entire time series as an object, we can decide, is it more like this one, like this one, or like this one? And we don't do this manually. We do this through clever statistics and, and sophisticated modeling. But what we end up with is we end up with every pixel on a map. And you could imagine the map as being a site or the whole of Scotland, peatland, if you like. And what we end up with is a map where we have the probability of each of the pixel belonging to one particular category. So this is the north uh, southwest corner of a wind farm in Cape Mess, where we've done this exercise. We've used all the inside pixels. We've allocated them to the maximum to the probability that they have. So we have a number of pixel, the darker the color um, or the, the shade, the more likely it is to be in this category. So we have some degrading areas, we have some good areas, and we have some stiff areas. With a bit of interpretation, we can see that these degrading areas tend to be associated with the dewatering and construction. So they are where there's been intervention on the ground that's compacted the peat and it's dewatered. We can see that the Blue area tends to be where there's been restoration intervention and there's been rewatering, so it's gone up and started to have amplitude and, and kind of go up and down again. And interestingly, what we see is that those floating roads have led to consolidation and underneath the track, which are those very strongly striking linear feature, it's basically stiff. But what, what is more is that we this is for a whole period, but we can then go and compare periods one to another. For example, we could compare the period of 2015 to 2019 and 2019 to 2023. And we know that restoration happened towards the end of that period here. This is the same southwest corner, but this time the entire site is presented to you. And what we can see is that following the restoration intervention in 2019, there's been a change, an increase in the area. If you focus here, this is mostly dark, black, mostly degrading. And now it's mostly blue. So the restoration intervention has had some success in bringing back the bog breathing behavior that we would expect from a good peatland. Similarly, in this area where there's also been restoration intervention, the blue has expanded. In other places where it was blue, it's become a bit stiffer. And by having the, the combination of the INSAR map and the, the management intervention, so by knowing what has happened on the ground, we can really tie the two together and have this much better understanding of the behavior of the people. We can do this year by year, and we can also look at change. Is, is it going in a trajectory where a pixel is getting better or is it getting worse? And we can use that to really understand how restoration intervention is working, but also how peatland condition in response to climate change, for example, is, is, is moving. And so I just wanted to finish really by, by articulating that we have around the northern peatlands around 25 million hectares of degraded peatland that we must um, protect what is in good condition, but we must also restore what we can and manage the rest in a way that increases resilience. This is a really big challenge and we have to deploy it at pace and at scale. And we need solutions, we need technological solutions to enable us to, to measure our efforts, to make decisions, to make strategic decisions, but also to monitor, to make sure that it's cost effectively delivered. And we think that from our research, not only have we got a new understanding of how people may respond to climate change in the future that can help us better predict um, their response over uh, with the climate change scenarios that are before us, 
but we also have a way of understanding how the restoration that is currently deployed might work or is working or is not working, where we might like to go and intervene again, or where we might just let people go because they're on a way to self-restoration anyway. So I think this is a really um, important uh, advancement of our, our understanding of people, but also a very cool technology that I think is going to have a lot of um, possibilities in the future, especially when we can deploy it in conjunctions with other technologies that are being developed. And with that, I'm just going to close it here. Thank you very much for your attention. I, I hope you've had a good conference and I was delighted to be able to close this conference and I will leave you with this beautiful image of uh, Peatland in Cape Ness and Sullivan. So this one is the Nuckfin Plateau, one of my favourite places. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Roxanne. Um, you might not quite have closed the conference because there may be a question or two. So um, are there any questions to Roxanne? Um, there don't have to be, um, but, but I don't think... I want to know which is coming over here to do that. <laughs> Did you hear that? Not quite. Oh, well, we'll get a microphone. To, <laughs> yeah, because... Frank is always worth hearing, I think. <laughs> Hi, Roxanne. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, good to see you. That was an excellent presentation. Thank you very much. My question was, when are you, when are you coming over here to do that as well? You have to leave your baby and come, come over. It's look like you can't keep you forever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it's a good question. In fact, you know, we, we can do it for the whole of Scotland. We have actually done it for most of the whole of Scotland at the moment. And it is firmly our intention to, to go and and visit all of those areas that have lots of peatlands like um, like the Outer Hebrides. And I think that within the merger, you know, the North Highland College that is now the Northwestern Hebrides, I think we, we have more opportunities than ever to make that happen in a meaningful way. However, I should also point out that we, through another project, we already have built up some of these collaboration. We've put an eddy covariance tower that's measuring the greenhouse gas exchange over one of the peatlands in, in Lewis. And this is all part of the same kind of big uh, intention to really improve the monitoring of peatlands across Scotland and combine it both the underground measurements and inside. So hopefully soon, Frank, is the answer. Okay, thanks very much, Rosanne, for your response, and thank you very much for your presentation. Really good. So all the best as you carry on with your researches. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we, we, we've, we, we come to the end. Um, well, not quite to the end, because there are a future session in, uh, in a few months' time. However, I should uh, wind up by saying just a few um, remarks. I'm not going to try and say anything profound, just, just to say this, though, for, for me personally, and probably for Des, but anyway, it, it, we, um, I remember when we began the northern, the, the northwest relationship between the RSE and the UHI and HIE, and we were looking, we had, the partnership was established, and we were looking for things to kick off that partnership that, that mattered on the ground, if you like. And I came up with this idea on the back of, literally on the back of an envelope. Ten minutes it took me. Islands, past, present, and future. And here we are, and, and it's materialized. And, and it's, it, to my mind anyway, it's been a great success. I thought the islands past was really a good session, but this, you know, and with no disrespect to Ireland's past people, because I was talking there myself, but, but um, I think this has been even better. Hugely fruit, fruitful, um, exciting, en enervating, energising um, session. Um, and, and as I say, I can't, I don't, I don't, don't, I haven't had the time to think about, you know, profound conclusions, but I think what's come out to me is the importance of community and the need to to remind ourselves that we, the people, can actually make, make, make our presence better and, and build for the future. You know, we need to get off our backsides, actually, and do things and challenge the authorities. And that came over in, the, in terms of the land use, in terms of, you know, the community trust, the, 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 um, the language thing, um, so much that, um, that uh, we could do, uh, or people on the islands anyway can do to 
forge a better future. I think, I think that's it. We can't wait for government to do it because, as Brian was pointing out yesterday in particular, and that's been followed up by some of the speakers today, uh, government is not, um, is not necessarily going to be helpful. Anyway, um, more of that um, perhaps uh, at, a, at, a, at a future event. But can I end by thanking a few organisations and people? The UHI, first of all, what our key partner on this one, the facilities they provided, the staff they provided, uh, the support and, and facilities have been um, first rate, I think. Um, uh, secondly, the technical team. You can't, there, there's a screen at the back there, or screens, and you can't see what's going on behind there. But there's something wonderful. There's flashing lights and screens and all sorts of things, which has meant that we can talk with each other uh, clearly and indeed talk to, to an online audience. So thank you very much to that technical team. Um, I thanked earlier on the RSE staff, but thanks again, because this couldn't have happened without the work you've done in terms of planning and operationalising what we've, what we've had today. I'd like to thank the speakers. I think every speaker has been tremendous, very, very different, very great, a great range of, of topics and subjects, but it's all, to my mind anyway, fitted together. There's been connections between what everybody's been saying. But um, maybe, above all, I should thank you for being participants. I mean, it's been a great participatory session as well. I think nearly everybody said something. And if you hadn't said something, I've seen people nodding or smiling, or, and I haven't seen much scowling. So, um, so that, I think, has been uh, enormous success. So thank you, everybody. Um, let's have a round of applause thanking ourselves and all those people I referred to. Thank you very much.